uh, with your permission, we'd like to start uh, and resume. Call to order this uh, second hearing on the amending the economic provisions of the Constitution. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge the presence of our colleagues, uh, Senator Grace Poe, the chair of the Senate Committees on Public Services and Economic Affairs. Good morning, ma'am. And uh, Deputy Majority Leader, Senator J.V. Hersito, the chair of the Senate Committees on Housing and Local Government. Good morning, sir. Uh, good good morning, morning, ladies and gentlemen. We'd like to acknowledge our distinguished guests present. Uh, we have with us, we're fortunate to have with us uh, some of the framers of the 1987 Constitution. Uh, Attorney Rene Sarmiento, former uh, Commissioner of the Comlec. Morning, sir. Uh, the eminent economist, Dr. Bernardo Villegas. Good morning, sir. Uh, from the legal profession, we have Attorney Jude Ocampo. Uh, we have a national scientist, uh, famous economist, Dr. Raul Fabella online. And we have from the chambers, the private sector, uh, the joint foreign chambers, Mr. Julian Payne, President of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines. Mr. Florian Gotain, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Executive Director of the European Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines with Mr. Paolo Duarte of ECCP. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Joseph Emmanuel Angeles of the Foundation for Economic Freedom. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, Dr. Clarita Carlos. Uh, we have Dr. Emmanuel Doy Santos online. Uh, from the government agencies, we have uh, NEDA, or National Economic Development Authority, USEC Rosemary Adelion with USEC Crystal Lin Uy, uh, Philippine Competition Commission Chairperson Michael Aguinaldo, Board of Investments Governor Marjorie Ramos Samaniego, Philippine Economic Zone Authority, OIC Deputy Director General Jenny June Romero, Securities and Exchange Commission Attorney Gerardo Del Rosario. Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, I think that's it for now. Uh, Justice Antonio Carpio, we see him uh, entering the hall. Morning, uh, Justice. Uh, so just uh, to um, start the hearing off, this is uh, specifically we wish to focus on the amendment which deals with the uh, public utilities and public services. That's under that's Section 11 of... Uh, Article 12, the National Patrimony and Economy. And as we know, there was a law passed uh, and sponsored by our colleague, Senator Grace Poe, and co-sponsored by Senator Franklin Drillon, which was approved last March 21, 2022, uh, where a public utility was clearly defined and distinguished from a public service, and the constitutional 6040 foreign equity limitation was stated to apply to the following public utilities, distribution and transmission of electricity, petroleum and petroleum products pipeline transmission systems, water pipelines, distribution systems, and wastewater pipeline systems, seaports, public utility vehicles. And for 100% foreign ownership uh, to be allowed, uh, including airports, railways, expressways, telecommunications, domestic shipping, subways, tollways. Uh, mention of critical infrastructure where foreign nationals were not allowed will not be allowed to own more than 50% of capital unless there is reciprocity accorded in, for, in their respective countries to Filipino nationals. And the, give, the president was given the power to reclassify a public service as a pass, public utility, uh, among others, other powers given to the president. But I think uh, the best person to speak on that is our colleague who sponsored the law uh, in 2022, Senator Grace Poe. Ma'am, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to thank our guests for being here today, also to clarify the issue. Kailangan ba natin ng cha cha para sabihin that we are open for business? Sabi nila sarado ang ating ekonomiya. Pero ang totoo, bukas naman talaga tayo sa foreign investors. We have made great strides in the past years liberalizing our economy without compromising our national security or leaving behind Filipino businesses. Would amending the public utilities provision in our constitution open the economy or open a can of worms? Mahalagang mailatag sa diskusyon ang mga naging debate at deliberasyon ng amended Public Service Act or PSA sa mga sektor na bukas sa kontrol ng dayuhan. We did this to encourage new players in sectors like airports, railways, expressways, and telecommunications. The idea was more competition means better services at better prices. All in all, a win for the Filipino consumers. Without changing the constitution, 
and guided by the long line of cases decided by the Supreme Court as to what public, public utilities really are. We carved out public utilities which will remain covered by the 60% Filipino ownership requirement from public services that were opened up by the PSA to full foreign investments. This is a repeat performance of what we did with EPIRA decades ago, where we carved out power generation from public utility. Hindi na po bago ito. Among those we retained under public utilities are industries known as natural monopolies or yung mga industriyang mas mura at cost-effective kung mag-isa lang ang service provider. These are various distribution, transmission, and pipeline systems carrying essentials such as electricity, water, and petroleum. Because of the nature of these natural monopolies, we needed to ensure the security and supply of these essential utilities. Sigur, sig, siniguro natin na Pilipino pa rin ang may control sa mga ito at kailanman ay hindi makokontrol ng mga dayuhan. Ensuring seaports under Filipino ownership and control was also a matter of economic and national security. As an archipelago, seaports are the gateways for large-scale transport of people and cargo. First line of defense natin ang seaports laban sa smuggling, piracy, at sa kahit anong banta at seguridad sa ating teritoryo. Panghuli, siniguro natin na Pilipino pa rin ang may control sa tradisyonal at dimakinang di pampasaherong dimakinang uh, di pampasaherong sasakyan para maprotektahan ng ating mga super lalo na ngayon, hindi pa maayos ang PUV modernization program. With PSA, we protected the essentials while opening up others to much-needed investments. Una na dito ang telecommunications na talagang nangangailangan ng mas pinalawig na kompetisyon para gumanda ang serbisyo at bumaba ang presyo. Through the PSA, we welcomed Starlink to come in and breathe new life to the industry Actually, yan ang unang-unang permit na binigyan ng National Telecommunications Company um, Commission nung pinasa natin ang PSA. Starlink was 0001. At sa ngayon, ang Starlink ang nagbibigay ng signal sa mga unserved at underserved areas. Pati dun sa mga bases natin sa Pag-asa Island. Sila ay dumidepende sa Starlink dahil hindi kaya ng mga local telecoms natin. Mabuti na lang meron dahil ang totoo nun, ang signal ng ibang bansa ay mas malakas pa dito sa ating mga teritoryong isla kesa sa sarili nating mga signals. So kung hindi natin pinayagan ng Public Service Act, walang Starlink doon sa mga lugar na walang signal. Kaya yung mga sinasabi nila, kailangan natin buksan ng ating ekonomiya, sana pag-aralan muna nila ang itong napasa na nating batas. Bukod pa dito, binuksan din natin ang ating airlines at shipping lines to key investment, networks, and innovation. Kaya nag, ngayon, meron na uling uh, United Airlines flight from the Philippines to the United States. Dahil nadagdagan na naman itong kumpiyansa ng mga mamumuhan, mamumuhunan dito sa ating bansa. Napakahalaga nito at lalo na sumigla muli ang industriya sa revenge travel pagkatapos ng pandemya. Doon sa mga nagsasabing, kailangan natin buksan pa ang ating ekonomiya. Yung mga iba, bumubulong pa. Sana ang mga dayuhan ay payagan bumili ng lupa dito sa ating bansa. Dahil hindi naman nila madadala ang lupa sa kanilang bayan. Totoo naman yun, di nila kayang buhatin ng lupa. Pero isipin ninyo, kung ang kompetensya natin, ang exchange rate ng pera nila mas mataas dito, sa mga Pilipino. Paano na yung mga bagong graduates natin? Paano na yung mga middle class? Makikipagkompetensya. E nung dumami nga ang pogo dito, naging napakamahal ng mga single units dito sa paligid ng Senado na ang aming mga staff na kung ikukumpara mo, mas malaki na ang sweldo kasi sa iba, ay eh nahihirapan pang magrenta o bumili ng unit. Bubuksan pa natin para sila ay makabili dito. Tignan din natin ang ating mga paliparan on how these can be revitalized through proper capital. 
We expect to see this realized in the upcoming NAIA rehabilitation. Kung titignan ninyo ang mga bidders natin dito sa NAIA, kasama dito yung mga nag-ooperate ng Incheon Airport, nag-ooperate ng airport sa Singapore, nag-ooperate ng airport sa Indonesia at sa New Delhi. Sapagkat na niliberalize na natin itong airport sector. As we opened up these sectors, we also placed safeguards to protect our national security and interests. For example, we banned corporations owned by other governments from investing in public utilities and critical infrastructure. Halimbawa na lang, yung isang banyaga na kontrolado ang kanilang mga kumpanya ay hindi pwedeng magmay-ari ng telecommunications dito sa ating bansa. Di ko nababanggitin, alam ninyo kung sino yan. Um, nalagay din dito na tayo ay may reciprocity requirements for critical industries para patas ang kalakaran. Halimbawa, dito sa Pilipinas, pinapayagan natin 100% ownership ng telecommunications. Pero sa ibang bansa na gusto mag-invest dito, hindi naman nila tayo pinapayagan, hindi din natin sila papayagan dito. Di ba? Para meron din tayong protection para sa atin. More importantly, binigyan natin ng kapangyarihan ng ating presidente na isuspend o pagbawalan ang kahit na anong transaksyon or investment na magbibigay control sa dayuhan sa isang public service kung ito ay may banta sa ating national security. So kung meron tayong isang bansa na pinagdududahan, kahit na sabihin natin bukas ang ating ekonomiya, pwede nating sabihin, sorry, kayo, hindi namin, wala, kayong, wala kaming kumpiyansa sa inyo. Alongside PSA, we, we are positioned to attract foreign investments through the amended Foreign Investments Act and the Retail Trade Liberalization Act. The amended IRR of the Renewable Energy Act now allows up to 100% foreign investments in renewable energy resources. Filipino companies have partnered with foreign investors for the Mabini Wind Power Project in Batangas and solar power projects in the Pampanga Eco Zone. While new investors are coming in, we have yet to see the full benefits of these laws. Sa makatuwid, bukas na ang ating ekonomiya. We have done so, as said by our esteemed statesman, former Senator Frank Drilon, without violating or amending the Constitution. Hindi natin kinailangan mag-con-con, con-as, o pecking initiative. Look at the industries we carved out. Power, water, seaports, petrol, PUVs. These are the remaining public utilities in the country. Yung Filipino ownership, critical for these sectors. Kung oo, bakit natin bubuksan sa kontrol ng dayuhan ang mga ito? As it stands now, RBH 6 proposes opening through legislation all public utilities to foreign ownership, investments, and even management without the constitutional protection grounded on national security and domestic interest. Hindi lang ito usapin ng pagpasok ng foreign capital at businesses. Tignan din natin ang magiging epekto. Pwedeng tanggalin sa mga Pilipino ang kontrol sa lahat ng sektor na nagbibigay serbisyo sa publiko. Pwedeng makontrol ng ibang bansa ang tubig, kuryente, seaports, gasolina at public utility jeeps natin. Handa pa tayo dito? Kaya ba natin makipagkompetensya sila? Makakasabay ba ang Pilipino at local businesses sa pagpasok ng foreign competition sa lahat ng industriya? Makakasiguro ba tayo na papasok ang foreign investors, uunlad ang bayan? These are the questions needed to be answered. Nasa pag-amyenda ba ng konstitusyon o palagi na nating sinasabi, nasa pagpapalakad ng ating mga ahensya, pagbawas ng korupsyon kung hindi man tanggalin ng todo-todo, at paglimita ng byurokrasya. Amending the Public Service Act took several congresses and decades of data gathering and study, countless hours of debates, interpolations, amendments, and discussions were poured in to craft just one particular carving out in our Constitution. Talagang pinag-aralan natin ang pangangailangan at epekto ng pagbukas ng bawat sektor. Kung dumaan sa butas ng karayom ang 86-year-old Public Service Act, mas lalong kailangan nating masunod Masuyod 
ang pag-amienda ng ating 37-year-old na saligang batas. Kaya maraming salamat sa inyong pagdalo ngayon para liwanagin ang, ang ating diskusyon ngayon at sa ating chairman sa pagpayag na magbigay ako ng uh, pangbukas para dito sa ating pag, uh, diskusyon ngayong araw. Salamat po. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Poe, for expounding on the law she sponsored the public services, uh, the amendments to the Public Services Act, which are very relevant to today's discussions. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge also the Deputy Minority Leader, the Chair of the Senate Committee on Women and Children, Senator Risa Ontiveros. Good morning, ma'am. As well as other uh, guests who have just arrived, uh, Department of Finance Undersecretary Bayani Agabin. Morning, sir. DTI Undersecretary Fita Aldaba. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, from the Australia New Zealand Chamber of Commerce, Kimi Sui Duar. Morning. I hope I uh, said that correctly. The ICT uh, Assistant Secretary Renato Paraiso. Morning, sir. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, so we'd like to turn it over to our colleagues, uh, Senator JV, if you have any. Uh, Senator Lisa, uh, any opening remarks before we turn it over to our guests? Please. Yes, thank you, Chair, and uh, salamat din, Sen uh, JV. Uh, magandang umaga po muli sa ating lahat. Maiksi lang po dahil pagpapatuloy lang ng hearing, pero siguro magbibigay na ako ng preview ng aking mga concerns. Ayon mismo sa ilang resource person sa huling pagdinig, Chacha is divisive and is not worth it. And I agree with them. Pero gusto ko din siya sa atin yung sinabi ng isang resource person na the patrimony provisions in our constitution as a business model are passe. Laos na ba talaga ang ating saligang batas na nangangalaga sa pang-Pilipinong likas at gawang yaman? Ngayon pong araw, pag-uusapan natin ang public utilities. Alam nyo po, ni-review ko ang mga discussion noong Public Services Act na katatalakay din ni Sen. Grace. And I saw the great care this Senate took when we identified the critical utilities that would still be under the protective mantle of the constitutional provisions on foreign ownership. Sa amyenda natin na ito, pati po ang critical utilities natin, eh, fair game na for future Congresses to give away. Yes, even to state-owned foreign companies which pose grave national security risks. Hindi ba't nagalit tayo noon nung lumabas na ang mga manual ng NGCP na may hawak sa ating state grid ay nakasulat sa Mandarin at hindi mabasa ng ating Pilipinong inhinyero? I'm also interested to find out if the problem really is the lack of foreign investments or our chronic failure to address anti-competitive, monopolistic behavior. Imbes na basagin ng charter change ang monopolyo ng mga dominant domestic companies, papalitan lang ba sila ng mga dayuhang kumpanya? Ganun din, baka mas malala pa. Baka ang mangyari, tatanggalin natin ang state grid kay C, pero ibibigay naman kay C sa gitna ng malalang alitan sa West Philippine Sea. Naalala ko ang mga ito at naalala ko ang aking tito, the late nationalist economist Alejandro Lichauco, na sinabing imposible ang pag-unlad ng bansa kung kontrolado ng dayuhan ang ekonomiya na bumubuhay dito. A nation that is poor, dependent, exploited, and oppressed by others, he warned, quote, can only have a population of farmers and workers similarly poor, dependent, exploited, and oppressed, closed quote. Salamat po, Mr. Chair, and I'm ready to engage later. Yes, thank you, Senator Isa. Senator JV? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Anyway, uh, we're here to to listen, of course, uh, our resource persons. But uh, I guess our two, my, our two colleagues have already uh, set the tone on what we want to find out. Um, the Public Services Act was uh, really uh, um, scrutinized by the Senate and made sure uh, that under our chair, Senator Grace, that it would be uh, for the benefit of the Filipino people to improve our utilities and other infrastructure and others. Likewise, Mr. Chair, we, we just recently passed the public partnership, uh, pri public private partnership code, no, which are all um, intended to improve our services, infrastructure, energy, and utilities here in the Senate. Um, I think we just have to give 
these uh, measures, the chance that uh, to to be realized. So is it really uh, is is uh, uh, charter change really needed at this point? Now that uh, these uh, two legislations were already passed, uh, which are intended to improve our um, utilities and others. Mr. Chair, of course, um, our energy and infrastructure has really fallen behind. Uh, we have fallen behind our uh, ASEAN neighbors. These are requisites for industrialization and development. And the high cost and efficient supply of energy really has uh, really hindered our growth. And we hope, but um, as mentioned by our chair committee on public services, PIRA was enacted in 2001. Um, we were in um, the Napa core power plants, power generation, transmission, distribution were privatized and uh was intended to to uh to foster to to encourage competition ang nangyari lang po yung privatization ang natuloy yung uh pressure ng kuryente remained high kaya nga sabi ng ipira mukhang ipinera so we have really we really have to be very careful about all of these things we cannot rush we cannot uh Put deadlines. No, we cannot be pressured because um, it, it it it's not very easy to amend the constitution. No, and uh, so we we cannot make mistakes, uh, Mr. Chair. So I uh, agree with you that we we will have to be very careful about it. And um, of course, we want to find out if uh, how can the economic provisions uh, or uh, amendments, the economic provisions, improve energy infrastructure utilities much more. Now that we already have passed the Public Services Act, the PPP code, so do we need really to uh, amend the, cons the Constitution at this point? So, Mr. Chair, uh, again, I uh, would like to listen to our uh, resource persons so that we will have a better uh, appreciation of the things that we um, that will be taken up today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator JV. Now we'd like to, again, thank you to our distinguished guests for coming. We'd like to turn it over to our framers of the 1987 Constitution, uh, starting with uh, Commissioner Sarmiento, Dr. Villegas, Justice Carpio afterwards, and Dr. Fabella in that order. Uh, so, Commissioner Sarmiento, thank you for coming, sir. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Sani Angara and uh, the distinguished senators. My friend Risa, good morning. Uh, Senator Grace Poe and Senator J.V. I prepared a paper for this morning's proceedings entitled, A Single Spark Can Start a Prairie Fire. I express my thanks to the Senate Subcommittee on Resolution of both Houses Number 6 for inviting me to this public hearing that has rich consequences for the nation's common good. I humbly raised two questions before the Subcommittee on Resolution of both Houses, and these are. Question A. Is it a Solomonic formula in lieu of the system of initiative to revise Articles 12, 14, and 16 of the 1987 Constitution? In letter B, should the Senate in the House of Representatives assemble separately and vote separately as they, through RBA's number six, propose revisions to Articles 12, 14, and 16 of the 87 Constitution? Now, my answers to uh, the two questions, starting with letter A, Solomonic formula. One, although RBH number six has put a stop to the church that trained by an initiative, and the same RBH number six has caused many to ponder its implications and impact. I have in my heart of hearts respectful reservations about its wisdom. The first is that revising the economic provisions will not be the Midas touch that will unlock the economic prospects and promise of the Philippines. Much has been written and much has been said in and out of the Senate that what are needed to charm foreign investors to our country are timely and significant alternatives, both legislative and executive initiatives to address a politicized bureaucracy Decline in the Philippines' score and the rule of law index. This small level of reading comprehension of pupils that places the Philippines among the poorest in learning in East Asia and the Pacific. Expensive electricity, 
slow internet, not enough seaports for big ships, and others. Next, moreover, and equally important, Your Honors, for the country's economy to soar high is to unlock the immense human potential and possibilities of Filipinos, their greatness, by further fleshing out the 26 social justice and human rights provisions in the 87 Constitution that start with Quote, the state shall. Yes, external miracles can happen only if there are internal miracles in our country. They both apply to nations and to individuals. Second, revising the economic provisions will be a spark that can start a prairie fire of succeeding amendments concerning political, judicial, social justice, and human rights provisions. After the first 10 amendments to the 1787 Constitution were ratified, more than 11,000 amendments to the U.S. Constitution had been proposed, though only 27 had been ratified. These ratified amendments are inclusive of political, judicial, human rights, and economic issues. The Constitution of India, when it was ratified in 1949, as of September 2023, 106 amendments had been introduced. A spark that is the revision of economic provisions can start a prairie fire of more amendments in the future. My answer to question B about separate assembly and separate voting. Section 1, Article 17 of the 87 Constitution states, quote, that any amendment to or revision of the Constitution may be proposed by, one, the Congress upon a vote of three-fourths of all its members or referring to initiative. The present Constitution does not say the Congress in joint session assembled Voting separately may propose amendments in this Constitution, which was provided in Section 1, Article 15 of the 1935 Constitution. The same Constitution that was in operation when the ordinance approved to the 1935 Constitution or the Parity Amendment was adopted in 1947, in effective on July 4, 1940, 1949. So, ibig sabihin po ang pinagtutungtunga ng Parity Amendment is the 1935 Constitution which provides joint session assembled. The same basis of the decision in Matibag versus Lopez Vito. The 1787 Constitution, the oldest written Constitution, which is the model of the 35, 43, 73, and 87 Constitutions, and many modern Constitutions in the world declares that an amendment may be proposed either by Congress with a two-thirds majority vote in both houses and the Senate, or by a convention called for by two-thirds of the state legislatures. Now, proposed amendment from the U.S. Congress through a joint resolution, as in our case, is done by the Senate and the House of Representatives processing the joint resolu resolution like a bill introduced in either house under the standard legislative process. The only difference between a joint resolution and a bill is that the former meaning to the joint resolution, once approved, shall not go to the president for approval or veto, but to the office of the Federal Register for processing and publication, and then forwarded to the governor of his state for submission to state legislatures. So, separate assembly, separate voting in the U.S. Congress. In India, a country whose constitution of 1949 was influenced by the U.S. Constitution, an amendment to the constitution may be initiated by a bill in either house of parliament by a majority of the total membership of that House and by a majority of that less than two-thirds of the members of the House present and voting. Separate assembly, 
separate voting. I most respectfully, respectfully submit. Maraming salamat po. God bless the Senate and the House, and God bless the Philippines. Thank you very much. Uh, those uh, comments are much appreciated, uh, Commissioner Sarmiento. Thank you. Dr. Villegas, uh, you have the floor, sir. May express my gratitude for having been invited to this uh, subcommittee. I'd just like to react to the statements already made by Senators Poe, Montiveros, and the Hercito. First of all, I fully support the statement of Senator Poe that we do not need to amend the Constitution, especially as regards media, advertising, education, and ownership of land at this stage of our development. Right now, we should have a single-minded focus on the scandal that we have 21% of our population living in dehumanizing poverty. That's a scandal because all of our neighbors in Southeast Asia have single-digit poverty incidents. And how do we approach this problem? As I see it, there are two major challenges to this administration. And I'm glad that the focus, at least in theory, is being made. First, agricultural productivity, food security, to really address the decades-old neglect of agriculture and the countryside. And I have a target for this administration. It's good news that for the first time in 2023, in all four quarters, agriculture production was not negative. Actually, that was not the case for many years before the present administration. You would find a lot of quarters before this would agriculture actually decline. If you take a look at the most recent GNP figures, in all quarters, it was positive, and the average for the whole year was a 1.2. My target for this administration is by the second half of the administration, they must increase agricultural production at least by 3% a year, which is what our neighbors, Vietnam and Thailand, have been achieving over the last 10 years. I'm sure you know that agriculture is very difficult to grow faster than 3%. You know, calamities, diseases, and so on and so forth. So it's not too much to ask this present administration. And I see that they're laying the foundation for farm <coughs> consolidation, the verification of products, digitalization, and industrialization. These are the strategies that I support. Now, they will not in any way change the potential of growth which this present administration has to achieve at least 8% before their administration is through. As you very well know, NEDA has always been talking about as high as 8%. And I think that is possible, number one, if we grow agriculture at least 3% per year, and most importantly, and it's an answer to Senator Antiveros, we get 15 to $20 billion worth of foreign direct investments which are very essential in today's circumstances. I'm sure those of us who look at the gross national product data know that we are also notorious for having the lowest savings rate in this part of the world. We save only 10% of our GNP. Do you know what is the average among our neighbors? Anywhere from 25 to 35%. Actually, China saves more than 35% of their GNP. Therefore, we have very little capital to invest in long-term infrastructures and other essential projects. That's why, yes, today we need to attract. And again, I set a target of 15 to $20 billion every year. And it was good news that we just heard that out of the $72 billion pledges that President Marcos has been obtaining in all these trips, $14 billion have actually already been implemented. So $15 to $20 billion every year for the remaining years of the Marcos administration are not too much to ask. Do you know what Vietnam got last year in FDIs? $25 billion. And they've been averaging $15 to $20 billion for the last five years because they opened up 100% foreign ownership of foreigners as early as 2014. 
Vietnam is a socialist economy, but they have been embracing foreign invest, investment a lot more than we have. That was changed by the public amendment of public service act. And I fully agree with Senator Polk that it's more than enough. If you take a look at the composition of this $14 billion that have been implemented for manufacturing, infrastructures, alternative energy, BBOIT, all sectors 100% open to foreign investment. If we open advertising, media, education, they will be literally chicken feed. They are not capital intensive and they will not impact on poverty as infrastructure, manufacturing, people IT have been. So it's clear that it is not time to have a, an amendment of the constitution. Finally, let me say that from all the road shows that I've been conducting over the years, and that's what I've been doing most of the time, going with private sector people, with trade chambers, going to Spain, Japan, and others. My feedback is those who want to invest in agriculture here do not require land ownership. They always lease their land. And right now, what we need are more Del Montes, doles into mangoes, avocados, coffee, cacao, bamboos. That's the way to increase agricultural productivity in a significant way. The government has to focus on helping the small farmers. Yes, practically all the resources of the government should be focused on helping the farmers because they are the poorest of the poor. But that is a poverty eradication initiative. It doesn't impact so much on productivity. Productivity will be improved if we have what is now happening happily, more and more large corporations, the Pagilinans, the Bengets, the Konsunihis, the Rensos, are investing in large tracts of land for coconut, for bamboos, for palm oil. And in fact, I see this as an accomplishment already of this present administration. In the past, I'm sure you know, especially those of you in the banking sector, a lot of these corporations rather paid hundreds of millions of penalty not to invest in agri-agra. Now, that mood has changed. More and more of large corporations see profit as possible in agriculture. Those are the things that have been made possible already by PSA, Amendment PSA. I don't think we need to change at the moment. In the future, I may agree that probably we should completely open all the rest, but they are not critical. Therefore, I do not think that we need the cha-cha today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Villegas. Uh, next, we have uh, Associate Justice Antonio Carpio. Justice Carpio was a uh, ponente of many of the uh, cases decided by the Supreme Court regarding the Constitution. Uh, good morning, Justice. Good morning, Mr. Chair, uh, Your Honors. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, uh, on this topic, uh, the proponents of the present people's initiative blame the restrictive provisions, economic provisions of the constitution for the low foreign direct investments, the high unemployment and the slow economic growth of our country. These are all false reasons. The Philippines today has one of the most liberal foreign investment laws in ASEAN as well as in Asia. The Philippines, without amending the constitution, has passed several laws to open the economy to 100% foreign ownership. The recently amended Public Service Act reclassified several businesses as public services open to 100% foreign ownership. Local banks are open to 100% foreign, 100 foreign ownership under Republic Act 10641. Retail trade is open to 100% foreign ownership under the amended Republic Act 8762, subject, of course, to reasonable minimum requirements on capital. And the generation of renewable energy, solar and wind, has just been opened to 100% foreign ownership under the DOE circular amending the IRR of Republic Act 1995-13, so it's not even a law. In particular, the amended Public Service Act allows 100% foreign ownership in telecommunications, 
air, sea, and land transportation except PUVs and airports. Power generation has always been open to 100% foreign ownership for the longest time. There appears to be a lack of understanding by our national leaders of the extent of foreign ownership under the law of businesses in our country. In an interview, President Marcos Jr. declared that he wants to open the economy to foreign investments, and I quote, except in critical areas such as power generation. Power generation from coal, coal oil, and gas plants has been open to 100% foreign ownership for the longest time. The Supreme Court has also allowed 100% foreign ownership of power generation from dams or hydropower plants. President Marcos Jr.'s own Department of Justice and Department of Energy have recently allowed through a mere implementing guideline 100% foreign ownership of power generation from solar and wind, which is as natural resources are under the constitution owned by the state. Let us compare the foreign investment laws of the Philippines, China, and Vietnam on telecommunications. Under the amended Public Service Act, foreigners can own now 100% of telecom companies in the Philippines. China at present only allows 49% foreign ownership in landline and cellular phone companies. Vietnam also allows only 49% foreign ownership in landline and cellular phone companies. On land ownership, let us look at our neighbors, China and Vietnam. Even their own citizens cannot own land. Their own citizens can own only a leasehold for 75 years. In Thailand, foreigners cannot own land, but there is a small exception, up to 1,600 1, uh, square meters, but only if there is a treaty with another country allowing Thai, Thai people to buy land in that other country. And there is no such treaty at present. So in Thailand, foreigners cannot own land. In Indonesia, foreigners cannot own land. They can only acquire a leasehold. So at we are better because we allow a corporation 40% owned by foreigners to own land. And frankly, land ownership is not, is not a requirement for investors to invest in a country. If you are a manager, you're sent to the Philippines and you recommend to your board in New York that you should buy the land on which your plant is going to be built, you will be fired because you don't have to spend that much to use the land. You need only 25-year lease. And you don't want more than 25-year lease because in 25 years, the labor situation might change. The labor in the Philippines could be more expensive than the next country. So they don't want to buy land actually for an investors who are engaged in manufacturing. Now, to add what what is the real problem of our law FDI? There are three causes. First, the high cost of power. We have the highest power rate in ASEAN and the second highest power rate in Asia next only to Japan. In manufacturing, energy accounts for at least 30% of your cost. And if you locate your plant here in the Philippines, you cannot compete with your competitor in Vietnam because they have low power rates. They will never come to the Philippines. So we have to address this number one problem. The second problem is our bureaucratic regulation. To put up a factory, you have to, in the Philippines, you have to get a permit from the barangay, from the mayor, from the department uh, in charge of the business you're in and the specialized agency that may also regulate you. In Vietnam and China, you go only to one office and you get all your permits. The third cause of uh, the low FDI is our infrastructure. Our infrastructure is behind our neighbors. Our airports, seaports, land transportation, three trans sea transportation. We have to address the real causes. The real cause is not the constitution. Nobody cares. The president has been going abroad and has been saying, I have secured almost uh, 500 billion pesos in foreign investment. And not one of those uh, foreigners who plan to invest here required an amendment of our constitution. That is all, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to present my position.
Thank you very much, uh, Justice Carbio. Uh, after Dr. Fabelia, we'll go to Dr. Braid, who is uh, online, also a framer of the 87 Constitution, and then Chairman Aguinaldo, uh, Dr. Carlos, and some of our friends from the foreign chambers. So uh, let's now hear from uh, Dr. Fabelia, national scientist and eminent economist. He's online. Dr. Fabelia, can you hear us? I can hear you. Good morning, sir. Can you hear me? <laughs> I think you're on mute, sir. Good morning. Good morning, sir. No, no I'm not using. Good morning, everyone. I thank uh, the subcommittee on uh, resolution of both houses number six uh, for this uh, rare invitation. I'd like to uh, first uh, state that I was never a member of the Constitutional uh, Convention uh, in nineteen. Uh, in 1987, there, thereabouts. And so I am kind of uh, misplaced, <laughs> but I still uh, am grateful for the, for the honor. <laughs> yes, I am uh, in favor of lifting the constitutional restrictions on foreign ownership, section 11, article 12. And I, of course, prefer uh, the quick, as quick a cha cha process as possible. I think that is separate assembly and separate uh, voting. My take on the development experience of nations is that all progress boils down to investment, specifically the share of income. That, nations, that the nation sets aside for investment, or what is called the investment weight. Countries that invest less will over time eat the dust of countries that invest more. And the investment rate depends on the rules binding on investors. The Philippine investment rate is traditionally lowest among the major ASEAN countries. For example, in 2022, uh, our investment rate was 22.4% of GDP. Vietnam had 33, Thailand had 27.9, and Indonesia had 29%. We, by contrast, by 20, but 2022 was a typical year um, over the last four decades. The, uh, the uh, People's Republic of China, as has been mentioned in some years past, had investment rate hovering around 50%. By contrast, we as a nation have privileged consumption over investment in our life. Government has been the cheerleader in our national consumption binge. Our government capital outlay was less than 5% of GDP. For most of those four decades, while it was between 6 to 10% of GDP, among our ASEAN neighbors, and of course, higher in China. We have, in other words, an anti-investment ecology. Three years after CREATE number two, our investment rate hardly breaches 25%. The task before this generation and this administration is to reverse this downward march to the bottom of the investment ladder. There are many reasons why our investment rate is abysmal. We have closed many economic sectors from investment, both local and foreign. Agriculture was closed for all that time from large private investors because of the property rights shambles stemming from the land reform program. 
mining and forestry. Uh, we're from time to time forbidden destination for domestic, private, and foreign investments. The six billion Tampakan gold and copper mine project is still in limbo 40 years later after it was initiated. The constitutional restriction on foreign ownership adds to these anti investment ramparts, which together Signal to the world our national fundamental discomfort with investors, either foreign or local. And when we opened up to foreign investment, we chose the foreign investment where the constitution was silent. In 19, the 1990s, we opened the capital account ostensibly to attract foreign investment, but all we got were the dregs among the investors. I mean, portfolio investment, or more pejoratively, called vulture capital. Foreign investment in financial assets and equities that are here today, gone tomorrow, after they have cleaned up without any appreciable impact on employment and output. We need direct foreign investment, especially in manufacturing and infrastructure, which create long-term employment and income, not portfolio investment. So the lifting of the restrictive rules will not itself reverse the investment downward trend investment rate downward trend. We will still need better rule of law, lower power costs, better logistics infrastructure, less signatures for investors as part of our pro-investment ecology. One area where the lifting of these restrictions can improve things is in the quality of foreign investors. Now let me let me uh, explain that a little bit. I attach it to the what I call the flavors of credible commitment. We know from the economics of contracts that when you have a deficit in reputation for performance, you break the spell by offering what is known as credible commitment. Those are facts on the ground that are costly to take back. In the shogun era in Japan, daimyos or lords would have to leave their families in the capital as a bond that they are not going to rise up against the shogun in their far-flung uh, hands. Newbies in a new car, a new car mar marketing, offer longer repair or replacement guarantees to overcome reluctance with plunging unto the unknown. Now, I, I recognize the, the uh, correctness of what Senator Grace and Supreme Court Carpio has told us. We have chipped away at some deleterious hurdles through some laws or amendments thereof, such as PSA and RTL. But laws are easy to reverse. The more credible signal of our commitment to be open is the lifting of the constitutional limits, since constitutional provisions are more difficult to change. We have been talking about changing the constitution uh, for over 40 years. <laughs> Let me recall the worldwide uh, excitement or to do over the Philippine People's Republic of China's amending its constitution to legalize, legalize private property. So the more credible the commitment, the better for investors. Purging the constitution of restrictions on foreign ownership can therefore raise the pool of and improve the quality of foreign investment, especially from those jurisdictions which have very strong uh, rules against uh, uh, corruption against uh, contracting uh, in corrupt, corrupt practices. 
and it should lift the age-old impression that the Philippines is a part suspicious of foreign investment. Now let me return to Article 12, Section 11, uh, that is um, being discussed. This is a policy instrument, not a value, it's a policy instrument uh, that framers thought may advance national welfare. The unspoken premise that native born capitalists are better stewards of national patrimony than foreigners. But I uh, propose that this is an article of faith. This is not a demonstrated fact. So we can debate how much DFI we lost as a consequence of Section 11, Article 1. What is not debatable to me is how much it has cost us. In one particular case, consider the Terminal 3 Philippine International, uh, International Air Terminals Company Incorporated, that's Piatco, scandal. The construction of Terminal 3 uh, attracted foreign interests, among them, of course, Farakot. But the ownership restriction on foreign ownership means that the foreign interest cannot own and run the facility. It needed a local partner to pose as majority owner. Some say a dummy. It found one and started constructing. But the local partner was embroiled in corruption cases, leading to lawsuits that cost completed terminal, completed terminal three in 2002 to be mothballed for a decade since its delivery. In 2016, the Philippine Supreme Court confirming an arbitral ruling ordered the Philippine government to indemnify Piatco to the tune of about 25 billion pesos. That is a capital and interest, principal and interest. Had the ownership restriction not been there, Terminal 3 would have been run and earning since 2002, and the 25 billion indemnity would have been avoided. 25 billion pesos was the real cost of the foreign ownership restriction in just one case, in just this case. So I concur with the proposal to lift Section 11 of Article 12. And indeed, if you insist, indeed all other policy instruments such as CARP masquerading as basic values in the 1987 Constitution. Will the lifting of these provisions create a tsunami of foreign and domestic investments? Well, we still have to solve problems of high power costs, high logistics, innumerable signatures, peace and order, and agricultural market distortions. Until then, only some improvement in the quantity, but probably more in the quality of foreign investment can be expected. It will not complete the pro-investment ecology that we need, but it will be a good start. Thank you very much and good day. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fabella. Uh, we appreciate the discussion on opportunity cost that an economist would provide. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge our, uh, our colleagues, uh, Senator Nancy Binay, the chair of the Senate Committee on Tourism. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, Senator Francis Tolentino, the Senate chair of the Committee on Science and Technology. Good morning, sir. Uh, next, we'll have uh, another framer of the uh, 1987 Constitutional Commission and Justice, I, sorry, I forgot, also the Chair of Justice, Senator Tolentino, uh, <laughs> formerly of Blue Ribbon, but uh, he, he did not want that committee. Um, so Dr. Braid, I think it's online. Can you hear us, uh, Dr. Braid? Uh, Florangel Rosario Braid is one of the framers of the Constitution. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Uh, can you hear us? Narinig niyo po kami? Ma'am, you have the floor. Ma'am? I 
Hi, ma'am. Can you hear us, Pa? Maybe we'll ask the staff to uh, liaise with her and we'll get back to her. We'll hear from Chairman Mike Aguinaldo. Uh, morning, sir. Thank you for coming. Hey, good, good morning. morning. I'm, I'm on Zoom. Good yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Go ahead. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah. Go uh, ahead, Pa. Thank you. Thank you for the privilege of sharing some memorable moments in history 38 years ago. Our past two colleagues have ably discussed the, the present predicament, but I shall bring you back to the drafting of the Constitution, of specifically Section 11 of Article 2. As we know, uh, I, I was asked to provide this update from these inputs from the past, you know, and that where the, the Section 11 dealt primarily with just water, energy, you know, but not telecommunication. So with the lobby of some of our telecommunication companies, we added telecommunications to public utilities. Um, the it in this as we know the, the section in uh ensures that 60 40 ratio of ownership be given not 60 in favor of filipino citizens no? but as we found out later many of the current telecom operators had violated the agreement no Specifically, let me just say, PLDT was summoned because of, I think, 63% ownership, foreign ownership, you know, where the voting rights were given to foreigners and only about 37 to Filipino citizens. So this is anomalous. And so um, we hope that such practice will not be, will that continue, you know. The amendment uh, to this section was also to include all executives and managing officers shall be citizens of the country. Um, we realize that maybe this phrase did not mean much in terms of voting rights, but it was a recognition of, it, well, past injustices and also that many of the companies had brought in their own managing executives to the country. So this, the, I think the, the question I would like to address is why, why the acceptance, I, the past three speakers, I, I, I think we support each other, you know, uh, that we retain the provision on on chapter eleven, on chapter twelve, on on the um, on the sixty forty sharing, no? even even a little more in favor of Filipino citizens. No? Uh, why? Because the twin concept of national economy is patrimony, and if we take out uh, the rights of our citizens, you know, we lose our patrimony. So this is. The reason why I think, and it's been emphasized in this article that the, oh, the, the concept of ensuring that our economy is owned by Filipinos and, and that the exploration and development shall be undertaken under the supervision and control of the state and that the state should only should undertake joint ventures only with Filipino citizens or companies at least sixty percent of which are of capital of the capital of which are owned by our citizens. So this is an apparent um, move, as we know, by the foundation of economic freedom to. Um, Amen. At least nine articles, nine yeah, articles on economics. 
on the economic provisions of the Constitution. No? But I trust that we not only retain Section 11, uh, even the um, specifically referring to the phrase that states encourage equity participation in public enterprises by the general public no? and that participation of foreign investors in the growing economy of any utility and enterprise shall be limited to their proportionate share of capital one. And all managing and executive officers must be Filipinos now. Now, going back, going now to the present, you know, uh, for, to us um, communication theorists and practitioners, we are alarmed by the fact that there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation and fake news, and it is therefore extremely important to the state to protect its integrity, security, and national sovereignty. Communication technology can be utilized for the common good, and it won't be a possible unless you are vigilant. We can lose what is what more what is what most uh, important to our survival, no? which is our natural resources, uh, as well as our integrity and sovereignty, uh, especially now by allowing the di continuing disinformation that could destroy our national fabric. I will not delve much into the uh, importance of communication technology or the role of communication in in uh, creating this information, which is now probably the one of the worst travails of the country. You know? So let us not focus so much on the lack of uh, needed capital, uh, which will come about if we have been able we are able to provide a more stable economic environment. So I would again plea about retaining 6040 provision um, in the Constitution and that we ensure that the other economic provisions of national economy and patrimony be honored as our future depends on. Uh, a strong state, strong nation that is built on uh, Filipinos you know, who love their country. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Braid. Uh, next, uh, Chairman Aguinaldo. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I was specifically asked to uh, comment on the proposed amendment to Article 12, Section 11, of the 1987 Constitution uh, on public utilities. Um, again, I'm, uh, uh, or I must stress that I'm looking at this from the lens of a uh, competition authority. And uh, ordinarily and generally, uh, removing barriers to entry is good for competition. Um, but I say that also as a theoretical for two reasons. First, um, if you look at the proposed amendment, it says, uh, unless otherwise provided by law. So that means that uh, it depends on what the law will be that will be crafted should the uh, amendment push through. So it depends on what the law will say. <clears throat> will it allow um, portfolio investment in these industries or will it limit it to foreign direct investment? Uh, will it limit it to um, companies that have a track record in that particular industry or will they allow just any foreign entity to enter? So there are a lot of variables that can only be threshed out uh, and so that's why I say it's theoretical at this point, because we don't know what that will be. In fact, when you say uh, unless otherwise provided by law, you could actually even increase the percentage, you know, from 60 to 80, you know. So a, a lot of it depends, and that's why it's theoretical. Secondly is, um, you know, when you talk about uh, effects of competition, you are looking forward. But at the end of the day, the proof is in the pudding. 
Okay. So um, recently we've had the PSA amendments. We've had retail trade, trade liberalization, I think the second time already. And so you would only know the effects on competition um, from the implementation of these laws. And I guess at this stage, it might be a bit too early, especially for the PSA, since it's quite new. So that's why we would say in a theoretical level, um, yes, it would be good, but um, decisions are not based solely on competition principles. There are other principles that are involved, other things that you also have to look at. So I guess from a competition standpoint, in theory, yes, uh, it would be um, removing barriers to entry would be favorable to competition. Okay, thank you. Very much, uh, Chairman Aguinaldo. Now we'd like to hear from Dr. Carlos and after that the Chambers of Commerce, uh, and then Dr. Angeles, Attorney Ocampo, Dr. Santos, and uh, Mr. Francisco, the president of BDO Capital. So, uh, Dr. Carlos, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I was taking down notes uh, earlier as I uh, listened to Senator Poe and uh, Senator Antiveros, and I'd like to address the issues that they have raised. I think I'd like to take off from the point of view of uh, social scientists who is looking at this from a macro standpoint. So I will not go into the integrity because all my colleagues here have already addressed any uh, many dimensions of the issue. I think the first question of uh, Senator Grace is, do we need uh, to change the constitution that, to declare that we're open for business? Um, and the quick and dirty answer there would be no, because you already are making so many legislative actions to open up the economy. But I think the challenge there is, uh, is it opening up enough or are we addressing really what we want to happen? Here, I'd like to go into a bit of epistemology, if you don't mind, which is, you know, when you establish something and you say that you know something, that means you have identified the composite of variables which will bring about a particular result, isn't it? Now here, as I listen to the very intelligent comments uh, around the table and uh, those who are joining us uh, in uh, virtually, and I notice that we are not able to categorize our variables into most critical, less critical, and so on. In other words, we don't have an ordinal list where one is first, second, et cetera. And that one, as uh, I agree with Dr. Fabella, cannot be an article of faith. It has to be empirically grounded. So however much we believe in these things, as a social scientist, if they are not empirically grounded, I uh, lang po yan. Okay, so I think uh, because all the senators have their own uh, research component, I would like them to pay attention to grounding all these claims. It's only if we have the hard evidence, the evidence conditions that will support them, that we can declare that we know something. That's the reason why you will notice we're shooting here, there, and everywhere. is because we're not able to categorize them into the most important, less important, etc. cetera. Okay, um, of course, Remember, I've been part of the cabinet for X number of months as national security advisor. One of the things I put together there uh, would be to present to our president in one cabinet meeting, I think it was late October or uh, early November, a national strategy. Why do we need a national strategy? And this is where I had, uh, you know, had to cross swords with one of my colleagues, uh, the NEDA head. Sabi niya, but mo pa kailangan national strategy? And na nga yung ano, NEDA plan, sabi ko. And, Dinuro ko din siya, sabi ko, eh no, bakit naman sa national plan mo wala man lang isang single line than about national security? And because I was the vice chair of the NTFL CAC uh, also at the time, so, bakit wala man lang dyan nakatutok tungkol dun sa mga uh, barangay natin at ano ang gagawin dito sa mga natitira pa na mga uh, influence barangay? Wala talaga dun eh. I mean, i-google ninyo yan at ano, uh, saliksikin nyo yan. Okay, what am I saying? If we're just shooting here, there, and everywhere, and we don't have anything, a big picture that will crochet together, that will stitch together all these things, then we don't know what to do. In terms of konti na nga ang salapi mo, kung saan saan mo pa nilalagay. Tapag the national strategy ka, pag konti ang salapi mo, alam mo ito yung number one, yun ang una mong bigyan ng pansin. Ganun din siguro dito, no? Bakit tayo magdasyadong degraded lies of foreign investment? What about domestic investment? Hindi ba natin nakita yung sinabi na nga, yung regulatory framework, sinabi ni Dr. Villegas kanina, kahit ang inyong mga domestic investor, 
ay sinasakal din ng overregulation ng ating gobyerno. Parang ang unang assumption mo eh, ikaw ay magnanakaw, saka mo na i-prove otherwise. No? Bakit ganun? In other words, well, we are so much banking in foreign direct investment, we should also bank on our local investors and talagang bigyan niya sila ng alagwa para talagang magawa nila ang kanilang ginagawa. Bigyan ko kayo ng example, no? Uh, my former boss here, uh, Senator Tolentino at the MMDA, uh, I was there with him no? uh, since 2010 as one of his consultants for the traffic management. Dinest namin, uh, Senator, I, I don't know kung nakwento ko na sa iyo to, kung paano yung bureaucracy natin as I've been identified by other resource persons, no? is really one of the major obstacles to why no investment is coming in. Merong isang gripo diyan na nagtutulo. No? So sabi ko, Ang bilis na, ang madali naman bumili ng gripo, parang 200 pesos lang. Sabi ko, sundan natin kung paano magbili ng gripo. Alam niyo ba kung gano'n ka, gano yun? Apat na buwan. Tinrace namin ito, Senator Tulente. Apat na buwan at 26 signatures para po makabili ng gripo. Gusto ko lang to make the point na the bureaucracy really matters. You have a Byzantine bureaucracy and I have seen uh, polls of foreign investors telling you that there are two major things, critical variables that matter to them, are Byzantine bureaucracy and the level of corruption. Yung ownership, that they don't matter. By the way, tama si Dr. Fabella. Ownership by Filipinos is an article of faith. It doesn't matter who owns it. Sabi ko nga sa telco, galing pa siya sa Jupiter, eh, basta magpagawa sa talaga ng internet, okay lang. Does ownership matter? No, not anymore. In the university, we're telling our students we are training you to be citizens of the world. We are breaking down all the boundaries of the artificial nation state. We already made commitments in ASEAN for regional integration. Why, for heaven's sakes, I was we so preoccupied on you know, keeping the nation state. It's one of the scourges of humanity, if I may say so. So last point, yung Filipino first po, tama po si Senator Antiveros. Pasayin na po yan, it should be rendered obsolescent, no? Bakit Filipino first? Because once upon a time in the past, we tried to, um, you know, to divest ourselves of all the colonial uh, things na, 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 uh, that chained us no, to the former colonial uh, rulers of our country. Wag na po tayong Filipino first. No one study I have seen thus far has demonstrated quite creditably that ownership by Filipinos work. I challenge anyone here around the table, the social scientists. Meron bang ganyan? Wala po. Ownership does not matter. Huh? But what we really want is, in fact, I had suggested in uh, uh, one of my papers that if our economic managers cannot, in fact, lower or eradicate the 21% of their big legacy na sinabi mo, no? na mga poor, aba maghar tayo po ng international group of economic managers, we pay them depending on the percentage of uh, increment that uh, they are going to contribute to GDP. I know this is an iconoclastic uh, viewpoint, but for God's sake, we have to be iconoclast now. You know, we are the fifth most mineralized countries in the world. We have millions of professionals. We should be embarrassed that we have 21% who are poor. Tama ba, Dr. Villegas? Tama, di ba? So I think, uh, yeah, let me go back to the issue of a national strategy. I address this also to the military. Several times they have asked me to help them design their strategy for the Air Force, for the Philippine Marines, etc. Sabi ko, saan ba kayo nakatukod yung strategy nyo? Meron bang national defense plan? O kung ang isip nyo lang yan, saan magagaling yung national defense plan, Senator po? Hindi ba magagaling yan sa national strategy? Dibuho yan eh. It's a big, big picture. And um, siguro, lastly, um, sorry sa Senator Ang gara medyo nagsosobra na ata ako sa time po. Uh, Senator Paul, you mentioned something about banning certain countries from ownership. And do I, uh, are you referring to China? Um, in the Public Service Act, any country that the president or the National Security Council views as a threat to us is actually eliminated from or banned from owning certain critical infrastructure, uh, telecommunications, for example, uh, I, I believe airports, etc. And also uh, countries that don't um, reciprocate or allow us also the same type of ownership in their country would not be allowed. 
that's what those are some of the safeguards we put as a compromise to those who are a little bit uh, wary about uh, this uh, Public Service Act being open. Yeah, with all due respect, I agree with the reciprocity, but the first one I don't. Because if you have a strict regulatory framework, then it can be a to whom it may concern. So I think we should not ban XYZ, whichever country. So thank you very much. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Carlos. Uh, Senator Lisa, yes. Salamat, Mr. Chair. Just a quick correction for the record. With all due respect, I certainly did not say that Filipino first is a passe uh, policy. In fact, one I of believe... your source persons. I stand corrected. Thank you, ma'am. In fact, I believe that Filipino first is a positive and dynamic principle in uh, formulating and constantly updating our economic policy. And lastly, Mr. Chair, at this point, if uh, 60 to 100 percent ownership in Filipino hands doesn't matter anyway in the big picture, then let's keep that in Filipino hands and work on the real problems identified both by those opposed to and supportive of RBH6. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Risa. Uh, Mr. Chair, just a quick comment. Yes, Senator I would Risa. like to thank also Dr. Carlos for bringing up something that we haven't really discussed in our minds being focused on foreign direct investments. It's true, local businesses are also suffering. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're actually hunting in the zoo. Like uh, the ones that uh, are, are complying with the laws, paying taxes, are the ones being audited. Uh, while the ones that are in the informal economy getting away with so much, uh, we don't focus our attention on. So uh, thank you for bringing that up. Thank you, uh, Senator Risa, Senator Poe. It's definitely we're not uh, abandoning the Filipino first. In fact, Congress just uh, passed the uh, Tatak Pinoy uh, strategy, which is an attempt at industrial policy, albeit uh, belated, somewhat belated for the region. No? Um, Sponsored and... Uh, uh, offered by our chairman. Thank you for the uh, salamat sa patalasta. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We'd like to... Senator, uh, just make a final comment. Um, as a social scientist, I'd like an article of faith to have empirical evidence. We cannot work on an article of faith. Filipino first policy should be rendered obsolescent. Thank you. Thank you for your opinion. Uh, <laughs> We'd like to hear from Mr. Julian Payne, the president of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, who, who's been our guest in the past for the CREATE law and the other investment laws. Uh, morning, sir. Uh, good morning, um, Mr. Chairman, Honorable Senators. Um, I'm going to speak on behalf of the Joint Foreign Chambers of Commerce. Then I will make one brief comment on behalf of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. And I have some colleagues here from the European Chamber and the Australia New Zealand who may wish to add some. Um, first of all, we thank the subcommittee for inviting us to comment on this resolution. We're honored to respond to the committee. The Joint Foreign Chambers of Commerce of the Philippines is a business advocacy coalition. We know that. It supports and promotes open international trade, uh, free investment, and improved conditions of business. That's what we advocate. We don't advocate anything more. That's where we focus. The Joint Foreign Chambers of Commerce supports the easing of restrictions on foreign direct investment wherever this is possible. And I'll make a caveat to that in a moment. We are of the opinion that the removal of economic restrictions would facilitate increased foreign direct investment in sectors where such investment is currently restricted. We recognize that the government's mandate and indeed duty in all countries is to protect national interests through some restrictions on FDA. That happens in every country. In this respect, that we, mo we note that most national economies, this interest is protected by use of legislation or executive action, not in constitutions. The advantage of using legislation or executive action is that with these forms of regulation, both the legislature and or the executive can quickly adjust to changing business conditions and the international environment. Uh, whether this is required by changes in technology, treaties, or just new opportunities for business. In recent years, the Congress, in its wisdom, has done just that with respect to amendments of PSA, the Foreign Investment Act, the Retail Sales Legislation Act. Our neighbor country, Indonesia, opened more than 200 sectors to foreign investment, again by the same technique. 
We have noted various past proposals to remove constitutional restrictions to foreign investment, including removing these altogether, or as an alternative to insert the phrase, unless otherwise provided by law, as proposed by the resolution for sectors advertising, basic education, and so on. This second alternative provides the Congress the power to adjust restrictions as it deems necessary. While the second alternative may not be as strong a signal to foreign investments of the first, it makes possible, if the Congress so decides, to further ease restrictions or not, that would facilitate foreign direct investment. The Philippine economy is now more integrated with the global economy than it was over 30 decades ago. The country has joined the WTO, the ASEAN Economic Community, and RCEP most recently. It has free trade agreements with Japan, Korea, European Free Trade Association, and will probably need to negotiate further FTAs, such as with the Comprehensive Trans-Pacific Partnership, to remain competitive and to exploit these opportunities for the Filipinos. For the Filipinos. Many of these developments emphasize the need for free movement of capital and a level playing field between foreign and domestic investors. And that gets to the core of the question of the economic provision. That is the statement of the JFC. I would like to make one comment on behalf of the Canadian Chamber. It seems to us we have two questions before us, and they're quite distinct. One is the question of restrictions in various sectors or not. This was made a point by Tony Aguinaldo. It could range from 100% to 0% in any sector. The second question is quite a different one, is where are the restrictions going to be set, in the constitution or in legislation? Now, the reality of the business world today is things are changing very rapidly. 30 years ago, we did not have online education. We did not have online advertising. The conditions have changed and they will change faster and faster as we move forward. And I think it's imperative that the committee consider which is the most appropriate body to adjust to and propose restrictions, whether they be 100%, 60-40, or zero. There are two separate questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would ask whether my colleagues wish to add anything. Thank you. Salam Apo. Yes, uh, Mr. Florian Gotain, the Executive Director of the European Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, we're really honored uh, to be here today. And uh, especially we feel privileged as foreigners uh, to speak here in front of uh, this committee. Uh, just to reiterate, basically, as European Chamber of Commerce, we fully uh, support the statement that was just done by my colleague, um, Julian Payne. Um, Again, just reiterating that amending the constitution is purely a Filipino matter um, that we appreciate that we have been invited. Um, and if the Filipino people decide to uh, amend the constitution, we would actually um, be in favor of uh, removing the uh, economic restrictions from the constitution. If you look at, um, again, um, coming from uh, what uh, my colleague, Mr. Bain said, if you look at recent um, uh, amendments to um, PSA, uh, to RTLA, FIA, but also the DOJ opinion on the implementing rules and regulations of the um, Renewable Energy Act have really created a more conducive uh, business environment for foreign investors to come in. And as you clearly can see also in the last one and a half years, this has really opened the floodgates for foreign direct investments in particular also coming from Europe when it comes to uh, renewable energy projects. So you can really see that uh, what is being done here in, this, in the Senate and the Congress has really a huge impact also then on how foreign uh, businesses react to it. Um, if, I think uh, it was earlier mentioned by uh, Dr. Villegas, um, this will have the same impact on education and advertising, we don't know. Uh, maybe it's more about the quality of uh, investments there when it comes to education to uh, improve the level of uh, education or the offer uh, of, of education here in the country as well, because this is also critical for the competitiveness of a country, as well as and also for our um, investors here to have um, qualified Filipino workers, especially also when it comes to new jobs, green jobs that we don't have yet here in the country. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair, just as a follow-up. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Gautain. Yes, uh, with, Senator Poe. With the foreign chambers, when we passed the PSA, I believe uh, you were quite jubilant about it, uh, right? Um, what's the feedback among uh, in your community when we passed the PSA? Yeah, um, Mr. Chairman and uh, Madam Senator, it was a very positive uh, feeling, actually, that you know, after 80-plus years, this uh, law has finally uh, been amended. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, it really has uh, contributed to uh, the attractiveness of the Philippines among the foreign investors. So did you see any improvement in terms of uh, interest and actual investments that came in after it? Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, I can just give you an example uh, of, of the European Chamber. We grew last year by mon more than 130 members. Uh, we are altogether 800 members. And just last year, uh, we increased our membership, new foreign uh, foreign investors coming in by 130 uh, new companies. Is there now concern because of this um, issue on amending the constitution with regards to uh, our foreign investors being a little bit um, hesitant because of the issues surrounding this now? Well, I have to be honest, uh, we got some uh, calls from some of our members uh, following the news and the political debate about how this might unfold or in which direction it could actually uh, move further. So there is some uncertainty out there, yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Duarte, would you care to add to that or uh, is that uh, your position as well? I represent the European Chamber as well. And I think uh, my colleague uh, uh, Florian already stated I, I might add one one sentence is that um, this we are very honored to be here. We understand that is a Filipino debate, and we don't want to be, let's say, deeply involved in promoting solution A or solution B. But we are also very honored that we have the chance to put our positions. So, but in in a sense, that, that this could be an opportunity to awake interest from more foreign investments in the country, knowing that, and I hear we can we can talk for the European investment. So from 100% investments in Southeast Asia, only 4% come to the Philippines. And we need to work together to increase this number. And everyone that needs to contribute. The European Chamber from one side to attract, but also the country to accept and welcome for investment. So that's uh, my just add on on the topic. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that's a useful statistic. Thank you, Sir Duarte. Uh, Ms. Duar, uh, care to say anything uh, for the New Zealand and Australian Chamber of Commerce? Uh, same position as my fellow JFC colleagues as well. We are very supportive um, of coming into the country. Australia, New Zealand, especially Australia, now has launched their economic strategic partnership for the next 17 years with Asia up until 2040. So we have also seen an uptick of Australian interest wanting to come over. So same position as stands. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, very brief. Dr. Angeles, uh, care to comment on the uh, provisions uh, we have? Okay. Yeah. And perhaps, uh, you know, Dr. Angeles has been a valuable resource during our public services um, bill hearing. And I would like to hear if perhaps he feels now compelled that we should open up um, other public services, uh, public utilities, uh, or are we okay so far with the PSA? Yes, please Based go on ahead. your observation. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah. Um, um, Honorable Chair and uh, members of the committee uh, and uh, distinguished uh, um, individuals in attendance. Um, first, um, perhaps um, as regards, um, first I had the honor of uh, working with uh, um, Senator Poe and her colleagues regarding the Public Service Act amendments. Um, that um, that um, law was um, founded on what we believe to be um, the appropriate um, interpretation of the provision that, in fact, uh, public utility regulation was focused on uh, the regulation of natural monopolies and their ills, and that uh, the remaining, uh, most of the what were remaining uh, sectors that were classified as public utilities 
in the Public Service Act amendments uh, were uh, considered to be natural monopolies. Those specifically that are considered by uh, the economic literature to be uh, still uh, natural monopolies would be electric power transmission, distribution, water pipeline uh, distribution sewerage, uh, petroleum uh, distribution through pipeline uh, specifically. Um, and uh, as I'm, I'm uh, related to note that from the foreign chambers that this has been helpful. That said, um, I, would, um, I would like to address a few of the points mentioned earlier. Uh, while I understand that um, Professor Carlos um, believes that foreign equity restrictions are irrelevant, uh, I would uh, like to address that by two points. First, are regarding the theoretical literature and empirical literature on control premiums. If, in fact, control was irrelevant, that control would not be worth a premium. And in fact, the financial economics literature has proven that there is, in fact, a control premium. Uh, number two, on the theoretical aspects of the legal matters, certainly, I think it's fairly well known that in corporation law, that certain basic um, fundamental decisions must be taken with um, two-thirds vote of stockholders, such as amendment of articles of incorporation, as regards uh, substantial sale of, substantial of all or substantially all of the business, etc. So <clears throat> these are matters which would be certainly important from a theoretical aspect. Now, um, from the empirical aspect, we have seen that with the Public Service Act amendments, in fact, um, there has been, and the renewable energy uh, IRR amendments, there have been uh, first um, higher, uh, there has been a higher interest in investment and at the same time, um, pledges made, which I understand as uh, um, Professor Villegas has pointed out, have resulted in at least about $14 billion worth. And that has translated to, uh, and a, a substantial portion of that was in renewable energy. Now, that said, I would say that, and I will confine myself specifically to the issue of public uh, utilities. Um, I would say that, answer, as you mentioned, as, as the chairman and has, has repeatedly mentioned, uncertainty is uh, something that is worth considering. And I think this also mentioned by the joint foreign chambers. Now, um, it cannot be denied that there are two pending Supreme Court petitions challenging the constitutionality of the Public Service Act. And while I believe that the Public, Surf uh, the Public Service Act Amendments law is, uh, will pass muster, uh, that said, the Supreme Court still has the final, uh, is in, in the end, the final arbiter of the meaning of the Constitution and its meets and bounds. So for that reason, I believe that the amendment adding unless provided by law would be uh, helpful in addressing the uncertainty which uh, the chairperson has in fact pointed out. Um, I, would, I also do agree uh, with the good Senator Poe that there are a number of restrictions, a uh, number of um, uh, safeguards that our policymakers, our wise policymakers, have added, which I think will help to mollify their concerns. One of them is the uh, state owned enterprise prohibition, which affects public utilities and critical infrastructure. As in fact, um, it was in fact asked in the last bar exam. Not even 1%, the, there was a proposed 1% investment. But even under that state-owned enterprise prohibition, post-effectivity, uh, there is no state-owned enterprise that can invest in public utilities and uh, critical infrastructure. There, are, As you also mentioned, there is a reciprocity provision. And at the same time, there's an information security provision, which requires uh, those engaged in the business operation of telecommunications to secure uh, those relevant international certifications 
for information security and prohibits uh, um, cooperation as regards providing uh, sensitive information, personal information. So if we are to this, if we so moving forward, I believe that there are quite a number of salutary provisions there that would help to mollify concerns uh, in of foreign, for foreign investment in these sensitive sectors. Um, may it please the members of the Honorable Committee. Very much. A lot of useful points there, uh, Dr. Angeles. Uh, Senator Poe, I think, wants to interject, and then Dr. Villegas is also raising his hand. So, um, I'd, I'd like to address my question uh, to our uh, Justice Carpio, having been a member of the Supreme Court as one of the justices. As you know, the Public Service Act is now being questioned before the Supreme Court. And maybe that's also one of the reasons why our chairman here and some of our colleagues um, would like to strengthen uh, the provisions of the Public Service Act by amending this through the RBH-6. Uh, what is your view on it, sir? Is there a legit legitimate reason why we should uh, go through this process? Or do you feel that the Supreme Court will eventually resolve it uh, soon? Well, Mr. Uh, I'm in favor of... Uh, I've connected is it connected? Uh, uh, yes. With your permission, Justice Carpio. Uh, uh, Senator Bina, yes. yes. Mr. Chairman, uh, and would the passage of this resolution uh, make the pending cases in the Supreme Court moot and academic? Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Justice. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, I'm in favor of the amendment uh, to that we include in the economic provisions the phrase unless otherwise provided by law, but I would like to add subject to reciprocity, just like in the uh, PSA, amended PSA. Now on the issue in the Supreme Court, uh, I think this would help if you amend the provision now to add unless otherwise provided by, then that will settle the issue. Because, uh, you know, the, the the way I look at it, uh, the uh, the interpretation of public utility is an interpretation reserved for the highest court of the land because we are interpreting a phrase in the Constitution and uh, the Supreme Court will always say, we have that authority. Congress cannot decide a case by defining a provision in the Constitution the way they want it. We will say what that provision means because that is judicial power. So the issue is, uh, does public utility include uh, transportation? Does it include uh, telecommunication? For the longest time, that has been the case. And whenever we say of, uh, speak of public utility, we always mean transportation, telephone, and that is the way the framers of the Constitution understood it. So it boils down to who can interpret the Constitution finally, the Supreme Court, or can Congress interpret it by legislation? So that is the issue now. If I were in the court, I would say it's the Supreme Court who can interpret the meaning of public utility. But you will say we will define public utility under a law. So there is now a conflict. So to settle that, just add there in the provision of the Constitution, unless otherwise provided by law, that would fix it. Because uh, my position is the Supreme Court is the final interpreter of the phrase public utility. Because that is the, the reason for existence of the Supreme Court, to interpret the provisions of the Constitution. Congress cannot take that power away by saying we will interpret it in a law. That's exactly the issue now in the Supreme Court. So I'm for this provision, but uh, just to add the phrase subject to reciprocity, because we cannot open our economy to Vietnam, to China, to Indonesia, when they are close to us. I mean, it should be equal, because we are sovereign states. Uh, we should be treated like their co-equals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justice Carpio. Tama yun. Di tapat tayo magpadugi. Senator Tolentino, on a related point with your permission, Thank Dr. Villegas. You. Uh, just, uh, Chairman, germane to the question of Senator Binay. So in effect, it would be, uh, the question was whether it would render the case mutant academic. 
uh, the answer implies the proposition that it would have a retroactive persuasive effect among the members of the bench. Is, is that the correct interpretation? Uh, Your Honor, Justice Carpio. You add the phrase, unless otherwise provided by law. That will solve the problem because uh, the Constitution itself tells everybody that you can now determine the meaning of public utility. But, but the PSA amendment was passed prior to this process. So will that have a bearing on that? If, if the Supreme Court would release its decision within the next few months, and if uh, looking at if there is a timetable, sans bullying, uh, this would be addressed by a plebiscite within the next few months, how, how would that, how would that uh, uh, jive with the persuasiveness? Well, uh, I'm, I, I have no idea when they will decide that case. So, but uh, for me to play it safe, it will be better to to put the phrase unless otherwise provided by law. Thank you. Thank you, Justice. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, back to you, Dr. Villegas. Yes, I'd like to emphasize the importance of what Mr. Payne asked. Should restrictions, Filipino first, which will always be relevant, be in the Constitution, or should they be legislated? And I'd like to give you a background about why those of us who draft the Constitution really made our Constitution a series of legislation. I'm the first one to say that sooner or later, we have to amend this very imperfect Constitution of 1987. That is a very important question, so I would love to hear from you, uh, sir. Because 1986, was not the appropriate time to write with serenity, peace, and quiet the basic law of the land. The whole nation, including us, were traumatized by the last turbulent years of the dictatorship, and not to mention the Edge Revolution. So emotions were high, and the idea was let's produce a document that will make sure that the dictator will never come back. And so our constitution is really an anti-Marcos constitution. And we jam-packed it with so many, many provisions that you will not find in most basic laws. And that is why one day I would like to see this constitution amended. The question right now is timing. I'm of the opinion that now is the time. But sooner or later, we must revise and remove all those restrictions and make sure that in a VUCA environment, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, we give the legislature precisely the freedom to be flexible. So we will always debate about Filipino first restrictions, and they will always be necessary. But the question is, should they appear in the basic law of the land? Mr. Chairman. And uh, Senator Nancy, yes. So, Dr. Villegas, parang today is not the right day to change the Constitution. Yes. I already said why. Because we have to first address the biggest problem. 21% 20 of our fellow Filipinos are going to bed hungry. Every when day. is the right time to do it, uh, Dr. Villegas? I was Villegas. saying, yeah. if the President is able to achieve those two targets, bring down the poverty incidence to single digit, which Secretary Balikasan is always saying, that by 2028, we will see a single digit. And how do you do that? I already mentioned, make sure that we increase the rate of investment to GDP to 30%. And you can do that only because of lack of uh, local capital. This will not be always, probably when we already are $10,000 capital, we will have enough capital to really implement Filipino first. But I'm talking about the sacred process today. We don't have the capital for Filipinos to invest long term in these infrastructures. So my, my feeling is because I'm optimistic that this administration will be able to achieve their target probably by 2028. Uh, uh, make the uh, plebiscite simultaneous with the national elections. And who knows, probably the next administration 
can tackle that issue. But I repeat, our constitution of 1997 is a very imperfect one. Thank you. That's a very, uh, it's a humble and honest, uh, frank assertion because uh, some people are tied to their work, but uh, you're obviously not. And you're, uh, as an intellectual, you're, you're, you've assessed it very honestly. We appreciate that, uh, Dr. Villegas said. I think this is the right time to insert some data we've received from the Senate Economic Planning Office or the CEPO of 18, because we're talking about uh, whether these restrictions should be in the Constitution or in uh, ordinary legislation. And uh, according to the Senate, the CEPO, the Senate Economic Planning Office, of 18 countries surveyed, uh, it is only the Philippines which has the economic uh, regulations or uh, restrictions on nationality in their constitution. Uh, the following do not. Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, Singapore, Japan, South Korea, <coughs> Taiwan, France, Germany, Italy, United Kingdom, and the United States. So these countries deal with these issues of nationality in their uh, legislation and not in their constitutions. So that's that may be one of the uh, reasons why um, many of those surveyed do not uh, uh, talk about the constitution because it, it is irrelevant to their experience, uh, your honors. So um, next we'll have uh, Attorney Ocampo. Attorney Ocampo is a, uh, a practitioner who uh, for tax and corporate law who has lived in uh, Kazakhstan and uh, lived and practiced investment law in Kazakhstan and uh, Cambodia and Vietnam. Or just yes, come I did some work on Yes, please, please. Uh, we, we, look, we, look, we look forward to hearing from you, Attorney Judo. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. And um, uh, of course, I, I'd like to say I'm, I'm uh, honored to be able to contribute uh, to this discussion um, in two ways. One, as, uh, as uh, the Honorable Chair said, as a lawyer who's worked in other ASEAN jurisdictions and even in uh, Central, Central Asia and uh, Eastern Europe. Um, second, uh, also as a, a managing partner of a, a small law firm that works primarily with uh, foreign investors. So as uh, the Honorable Chairman said, I've actually worked in uh, very exotic locations. So Kazakhstan, I was a, a tax advisor in uh, uh, Budapest in Hungary, uh, and I've worked with a regional uh, law firm. It's called DFDL. Uh, I did some work on Cambodia, Myanmar, uh, Vietnam, uh, taxation and investment. The, and what I can, I hope to contribute is that, uh, in my observation, the decision of uh, a company to invest in a certain location, uh, it's almost the same everywhere else. So in, uh, let's say, uh, an American company, you would have what maybe we can call here a sponsor. It's one person in the com company that thinks, okay, there's an opportunity in the Philippines. And then that company would normally also have an investment committee. And that sponsor, that person, will then go uh, to the investment committee and defend uh, his uh, uh, proposal to invest, say, in the Philippines or Vietnam or Cambodia. Um, one of the things that is very important there is his defense of whether or not a certain hurdle rate uh, would be met. So it's an investment uh, rate uh, that is based on the capital cost and borrowing cost of that company, right? So uh, that person will say, yes, I will go. It would be higher than a cert this certain hurdle rate. So let's invest in the Philippines or Vietnam or Cambodia or what have you. The next step usually is a legal study, what the investors call a market entry memo. In that market entry memo, uh, Law firms such as ours, we are asked, okay, uh, what are the rules? How do we set up? Um, if the investment goes awry, how do we exit? Uh, is there a predictable uh, legal regime? So that's the, that's the usual uh, route. And then if the investment committee is happy, uh, they do some final calculations and they put the money in. All right. So, um, I'd like to echo actually what uh, the uh, uh, Honorable uh, Supreme Court Justice Carpio said earlier, that among the things that uh, impact uh, investment is the efficiency of the bureaucracy. Because bureaucratic efficiency is actually among those that they factor into 
when they determine if uh, they're going to be able to set up immediately, will they be able to set up easily? Um, if they exit, will there be costs? Um, the other um, uh, issue would be on predictability. Because when they set that hurdle rate, when they calculate the hurdle rate, they make a lot of economic uh, assumptions. And so a sudden change in the law or a sudden change in the interpretation by the Supreme Court of a law would put that calculation in danger. Again, the, 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 also just, just my observation, it's this thing, it's the hurdle rate. It's whether or not um, you will make the company will make more money than uh, its cost of capital is the one that's important to these investors. So again, two things, it's bureaucracy and predictability, right? And uh, at the risk of sounding like a fan of uh, Justice Carpio, I'd also like to, uh, to, to um, echo what he said about the uh, PSA uh, matter. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, I was also speaking with uh, Dr. Angelis earlier about it. Um, the problem really is that, yes, there, it was passed, and it's a great uh, piece of legislation. Um, uh, our firm actually uh, uh, benefited a bit from the Public Service Act uh, amendment and the change in renewable energy because those are our clients. Um, and they were very enthusiastic when those when, when the Public Service Act uh, was amended and when the DOJ and DOE uh, revised the IRR uh, for RE, uh, uh, renewable energy uh, uh, investments. Uh, the other one, uh, by the way, is uh, the amendment on the Retail Trade Act. The, the, that one actually also created some excitement uh, uh, with the foreign law firms that we work with and, and foreign clients. But going back to the PSA, um, I think uh, during the time that you know it came out and uh, we would have discussions, the practitioners, on whether the challenge in the Supreme Court or what's going to happen to, to this. Uh, I think many practitioners think that um, the uh, uh, validity would likely be uh, confirmed, but there's always that risk uh, that, uh, as uh, Justice Carpio said, um, it's a, a very important constitutional issue. Can the uh, legislature actually define what's in the constitution or can the Supreme Court ignore that definition and uh, look to other uh, sources uh, to determine what public, uh, uh, public utility is? And just to make sure that there's no such risk, uh, it may be good to actually adopt the uh, changes uh, uh, proposed uh, as otherwise provided by law, or as uh, uh, Justice Carpio said, maybe you can include also reciprocity. Um, in, in the end, uh, with regard to the issue of whether or not the national uh, uh, ownership restriction should be in the Constitution, in the end, it's about trust. Do we trust future House of Representatives and future Senates to act responsibly? and uh, uh, promote uh, the national uh, uh, welfare when they prescribe these uh, uh, levels or threshold for uh, Filipino ownership. So I think uh, uh, if there's something else that uh, I would be able to contribute to this honorable committee, I'm happy to uh, assist sometime in the future. But as of now, I think uh, uh, I can end my uh, discussion there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Just a quick uh, manifestation in response to one of the later points raised by Attorney Ocampo. Uh, tingin ko nga, and this is related to one of the questions I'll raise uh, when my turn comes later. Sa tingin ko po, sobrang critical nga na hindi lang ipagkatiwala carte blanche sa mga future na hindi pa natin kilalang mga kongreso. Ang ganitong, <laughs> ang ganitong kakritikal na usapin. Uh, salamat, Mr. Chair. I guess it's a, it's a debate about political yeah. maturity also, di ba? Very important. If you don't give that power to institutions, then when do you become mature, di ba? So right if you that. assume immaturity. Uh, Dr. Villagas. No, that's a very important point. When we wrote the Constitution, who were we, 50 members of the Commission, who would say that we are the only ones who can protect 
deal filled with welfare. It's, I think, unfair to say we don't trust the future. What about us? Do they trust us? Who are we? I trust you, sir. I trust no, you. No, no, no. But, but, but precisely, <laughs> when I was against so many of these restrictions, they were saying, oh, we cannot trust the future legislature. But do you think we are trustable? We are trustable. I think, I think it's part yeah. of our journey uh, to being a mature political democracy. Exactly. Uh, so I, I how much not... power do we entrust to our legislat legislators who are elected by the people and, and they are our representatives at the end of the day, exactly. uh, whether we like what they're doing or not. So that's where elections come in and uh, uh, we make our choices. Yes, yes, Commissioner uh, uh, Sarmiento. There is a mention by Attorney Jude about <clears throat> general welfare as a guide for legislators and lawmakers. And reference is made by uh, <clears throat> Justice Carpio to reciprocity. There is a provision that will guide us actually in the article in the national economy addressing these two points. It's in section 13 that provides the state shall pursue a trade policy that serves the general welfare and utilizes all forms and arrangements of exchange on the basis of equality and reciprocity. So this addresses or answers the question or the suggestion of Justice Scarpio and the points raised by Attorney Shun. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. you. Thank you very much for pointing that out, uh, Commissioner Sarmiento. Mr. Next, Chair. we'll have uh, Senator Risa again. Salamat, Mr. Chair. Just an additional uh, brief manifestation. On the matter of trust and institutions, uh, paalala lang sa atin na uh, in the Constitution itself, there are well-defined processes to amend the constitution uh, itself wide open uh, for uh, con con uh, congressional and citizen participation and again these are also elements of that process of political maturation salamat mr chair thank you very much uh, i think dr fabel is raising his hand so but, but before we recognize him we just want to highlight that point of of commissioner sarmiento earlier during his position paper where he said that there are 11,000 amendments proposed to the U.S. Constitution over 200 or so years, and only 27 have been adopted. So if we average it out, there are an average of 46 amendments proposed a year and an amend, amendment, a successful amendment every 8.7 years. Just to, In the Philippines, since 1987, there have been, according to the House, there have been 358 uh, proposed cha-cha measures or charter change measures over the last 37 or 38 years, which is roughly uh, an amendment proposed once every 10 years. And this is, if we succeed, this will be the first amendment. So I guess if we're talking about political maturity, uh, we have to ask ourselves, that is the process we're going through a part of our political maturity? Will uh, I definitely engaging in it, talking about it in front of our people in an open and transparent manner, nakakatulong yun sa ating taong bayan na karamihan, let's face it, Eh, hindi naman mahalaga sa kanila yung ating saligang batas. So I think in that sense, it is, it is uh, an educational process for our people. And I think this is the first time we've really gone in-depth in terms of discussing the economic uh, provisions because uh, we've been sidetracked by often the discussion has not been focused, which is why uh, this representation has really wanted to focus on the three provisions at hand. Although we welcome the opinions of our uh, eminent uh, personalities because it's very rare that we have them all in the same room. So thank you very much. Dr. Fabelia, uh, can we hear from you, sir? You're raising your hand. Thank you very much. This is on trust. And um, um, moving on from Dr. Villegas's manifestation um, about his idea, about his thinking of the Constitution, let me just um, comment that the 1987 Philippine Constitution, I think, this is, uh, I'm not a constitutionalist uh, in any way, I think fails the simple aesthetics of brevity on the separation of principles and instruments. The reason why the Philippine 1987 Constitution is rather lengthy is because uh, of the inclusion of instruments rather than uh, principles and values uh, into the body of the Constitution. This section, for example, state policies, contains 27 sections, all of which, let me repeat, all of which constrain future governments 
in certain directions. What it tells us citizens is that the framers of the 1987 Constitution harbored a deep distrust for future governments, and that is the, uh, including the current um, uh, generation, to act with prudence. And so their hands should be tied. But this also limits their capacity to respond to changing social, physical, and technological environments. In other words, resilience be damned. So, uh, there are uh, provisions in the Constitution that are also economic, but which we're not going to uh, include in the cha-cha, but I wish that they would be included. For example, uh, the, the issue on land policy and, and uh, the um, comp comprehensive agrarian reform program. Uh, so uh, again, uh, I reiterate the idea that laws are uh, rather easy to uh, reverse, and therefore it doesn't have the binding, um, credible commitment value of a um, the lifting of the, the uh, restrictions of the constitution. The PSA may well be uh, declared unconstitutional by the, by the Supreme Court, which is why it's best to have. Um, the uh, restrict the uh, lifting of the restrictions of the uh, on 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 foreign ownership in the constitution. I thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor Fabella. Now we'll go to Doctor Emmanuel Dois Santos. He's with us online. He's uh, uh, based in Australia and he's an advisor to the Australian government and local governments uh, on political and economic matters. Doctor Santos, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, and honorable members of the committee and the Senate for this opportunity to shed light on the matter at hand. Um, next slide, please, if the slides are there. I have a slide presentation that I'll take you through. Uh, there will... are actually no slides. Can we ask the committee? Oh, sorry. Committee secretary um, to anyway, I have prepared some, some remarks, so whenever they can load it there, I, um, I'll just take it from wherever it starts. Um, so, good morning to you all. Um, the 1987 Constitution, uh, it, some general remarks first, Mr. Chair. The 1987 Constitution is only the latest in a long line since 1935 to contain restrictions to foreign ownership and its provisions. But the origins of these restrictions even predate that. The 1899 Malolos Constitution did not contain any restrictions to foreign participation in our economy. Ironically, by a strange twist of fate, it was the U.S. annexation of the Philippines that caused these restrictions on foreign ownership to be inserted in the Philippine Organic Act of 1902. By the way, I have to state at the start that I am here in my private capacity and my opinions are mine alone, do not represent that of my employer. Thank you. Um, so, as a concession to the Democratic House members from the South in the U.S., fearful that cheaper goods, especially sugar, from the Philippines would flood U.S. markets, American citizens and corporations were prevented from holding vast tracts of land, engaging in mining, banking, and utility franchises in the Philippine Organic Act. The U.S. colonial government then sought to appease the Filipino revolutionaries by offering them land through land reform under Governor Taft. However, the Treaty of Paris required the U.S. to compensate the Spanish friars for these lands that the Katiponeros had occupied during the revolution. This made the cost of owning uh, productive assets unaffordable for most beneficiaries because the U.S. Treasury made them pay for these costs. This is from a paper by Aaron Marr, because you can't see the slides yet, um, published by the Harvard Business School in 2008. As a result, Mr. Chair, land ownership became concentrated in a wealthy class of local principales, more concentrated among the top quartile compared to the Spanish era, meaning to say land ownership became even more concentrated perversely under the U.S. attempt to engage in land reform between 1903 and 1918. 
From economic concentration of assets, Mr. Chair, to political consolidation of power in 1910, when the first elections of the Philippine Assembly took place, a new professor, uh, Paul Hutchcroft, noted that local elites gained national prominence from where they awarded franchises. And then in the 1935 Commonwealth Constitution, this was cemented through the 6040 rule. What started as a strange quirk caused by US domestic politics in 1902 led to a permanent fixture of increased protectionism. The only exception to this rule was granted to US citizens and corporations after World War II, which was the condition set for granting our independence. Now, although Mr. Chair, uh, it was considered a stain on our national sovereignty, the parity rights granted to US investors actually led to rapid growth in the 1950s, the highest rate of growth that the Philippines has experienced post-war. Through trade and monetary policies that bias the importation of capital, uh, sorry, sorry, that's okay. I just got a message from the Secretariat. That's okay if there's no slides. Um, bias the importation of capital, intermediary goods for production over consumer goods. Um, Hutchcroft notes that manufacturing expanded by double digits during much of the decade and the value add by industry also increased. Under President Magsaysay, the Philippines privatized many of the state-owned enterprises set up in the aftermath of the war. After Magsaysay's untimely death, the Filipino first policy gave preferential treatment to locals in using import quotas. The result was that local businesses misused these quotas to import finished goods rather than capital goods, and so the consumer bias that was spoken of earlier began. The system was gamed and corruption ensued, leading to weaker growth, triggering a foreign currency crunch, which devalued the peso and led to slower growth in the 1960s compared to the 50s. This was the first boom-bust cycle, which halted that our transition to a modern economy as agro um, exporters uh, uh, earned a windfall from the weaker currency, even as industrial, even as the industrial sector faltered. This led to social unrest and public clamor, which led to the, 19, the convening of the 71 CONCON, of which my father was a member, where more restrictions on foreign direct investments were introduced. Um, this demonstrated that we had not learned the lessons from the deb debacle of the first Filipino policy. I'm on slide 10, by the way, for the Secretariat's information. Also, the U.S. parity rights enacted in 1946 lapsed by 1974, so there were no more restraints on the nationalist agenda. Slide 11, please. In the 70s, the state took the lead in industrialization through sequestration and nationalization, relying on public debt to finance it. Slide 11. Oh, are we, are we there? Yes. Lead, leading to, to uh, relying on debt to finances, this created a bubble that became unsustainable. The change in regulation led to a precipitous fall of FDI in the late 70s and contributed to the economic collapse in the 80s and tepid growth in the 90s. We missed the first wave of Japanese FDI, which flowed instead to our ASEAN neighbors. UP School of Economics professor Noel de Jos attributes this to the perfect storm of our economic malaise, becoming the perennial sick man of Asia. Slide 12, please. Mr. Chair, contributing to this malaise, the sectors subjected to foreign restrictions were expanded further in the 87 constitution. Next slide, please. This led Dr. Overholt of Stanford to comment that regardless of which regime was in place, the Philippines constra was constrained by an unho unholy alliance, quote unquote, of un entrenched interests both from the left and the right. Next slide, please. Mr. Chair, the World Bank noted that foreign ownerships correlated with labor productivity and might I add higher wages. This is not only due to foreign capital, but transfer of know-how. Harvard professor Hausman, Ricardo Hausman, who I know you're familiar with, Mr. Chair, says that unlike tangible intellectual property, which can be codified or easily acquired, tacit knowledge is stored in the brain and not easily transferred. It is easier to transfer this kind of know-how by moving the brain itself, i.e. the person, and therefore to Christ greater openness on our part to foreign participation in our economy for diffusion to, uh, of innovation to take place. As you can see, foreign share of, the share of own, foreign ownership of firms in our country remains small. Next slide, please. The World Bank further notes that um, the economic concentration in the Philippines is higher compared to our neighbors, particularly in manufacturing, 
Despite the 100% FDI being permitted there, does it have anything to do with the fact that our energy uh, is a key driver of the manufacturer's costs and that the 60-40 until very recently remained in place and remains in place for transmission and distribution? Next slide, please. Mr. Chair, the Philippines is rated highly restrictive to FDI by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. If you drop down into the weeds of their scoring system, you will find that it is due to the provisions in our charter mainly, which do not appear elsewhere, as you have already alluded to, Mr. Chair. I, can, I have provided the subcommittee with a spreadsheet on which these scores were based for its information. Next slide, please. We continue to see the results of this restrictiveness in our inability to attract foreign direct investment. The Philippines is unique in our region, comprised of former colonies, Australia and New Zealand included, or occupied countries such as Japan and Korea, for having these restrictions hard-coded in our constitution. Next slide, please. As a result, we've been overtaken by our ASEAN neighbors. Um, uh, next slide, please. As a result, we have been overtaken by our ASEAN neighbors. Vietnam, next slide, please, being the latest to overtake us. Next slide, please. In the 90, in 1985, we had three times their per capita income in Vietnam, but due to their opening up through the Doi Moi reforms of 86, while we were increasing the restrictions in our 87 constitution, Vietnam has over, finally overtaken us 35 years later in per capita GDP and minimum wages, may I add. Next slide, please. So turning to RBH 6, which considers granting legislative fiat to regulate the ownership of public services, basic education and advertising, we might ask, why is it needed, Mr. Chair? As you have, as some members of the committee have asked already. Evidently, the PSA has not necessarily solved the problem. After removing electricity generation from the 6040 rule through PSA, which is still subject to court uh, deliberations, Renewable energy is considered one of our bright spots for investment. The problem is that our electricity grid and the lack of connectivity for commercial solar and wind power projects, which are in remote places, but closer to the consumers. Distribution is still subject to 60-40. As renewable energy increases its penetration in our energy mix, the upgrade of the grid is needed to handle variable energy, or else we will risk short-circuiting and blackouts as per what happened in Panay earlier this year. Existing legislation tries to manage this, but causes slower take-up of rooftop solar due to the higher associated costs. Ari Pesco, director of the Electricity Law Initiative at Harvard, Univers Harvard Law School, talks of a utility transmission syndicate in the United States, which prevents the, the integration of solar and wind and battery. The Federal Energy yeah. Regulatory Commission has said, he said, has tried numerous times to expand transmission capacity to, to capture new clean energy sources. This decades long effort has been nearly in, an impossible task, he says, transforming a system of utility monopoly fiefdoms, Mr. Chair, into competitive marketplace. As Ari put it, what the FERC is trying to do is counteract the incentives and abilities of utilities to act uncompetitively. The problem is utility control and utility interest in maintaining the status quo. Utilities, he says, for the most part, inherently aren't against clean energy, but they deploy it at the place and scale that will benefit them. So, Mr. Chair, that is one argument that I would like to put forward. I have other slides, but I will leave it at that, as I believe that I have already um, exceeded my time at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Thank you very members. much. Uh, we appreciate the historical perspective. Uh, Dr. Santos. Thank you. Uh, can we hear from Mr. Ed Francisco from the president of BDO Capital? Morning, sir. Or good afternoon, rather. Good afternoon, sir, uh, your honors. Now, I just wanted to share my views. Thank you for allowing me to be here. I represent the banking industry, but in my case, I'm a practitioner. Uh, I daily speak to foreign and local investors. In fact, I'm the one talking to all the investors for the NAIA privatizations. So I'm dealing for both foreign and local. Those are the long-term kinds of investors. I also deal with the short-term investors or what as uh, Dr. Villegas talks about the hot money because the stock market, I also manage that, the, that business. So I'm doing two IPOs. So at least as my value add there is that I talk to the investors if they're willing to invest already. Uh, and basically, I guess I, su I support what Dr. Villegas and Justice Carpio said. Um, the PSA, the Foreign Investment Act, the Trade Liberalization Acts are great. And then um, Sen Senator 
Paul asked earlier, there was really a lot of positive news from foreign investors who want to invest. They're dealing with me because they want to invest, especially in renewable energy. Um, the, the big problem or the complaint they have is not naman the ownership limits. The, at least from a practitioner's perspective, their complaints are really more the bureaucracy, corruption, and red tape. Maybe uh, just as an example, for the foreign investors we talk to in renewable energy, it's been reduced already, but it still takes 167 signatures for, for, for a project to get approved. So even if with the Renewable Act, with all this trade, uh, I guess with the with the, uh, I guess, tax benefits already. It just takes so long and it takes around five years. So even if we're all in one, we want to have more energy, you want it cheaper, what's preventing the investors from actually getting their project is all the bureaucracy. So it's not naman the, the foreign... Can, can I just, sorry, I don't yes, usually sorry. interrupt my resource person, sorry, sorry. but that is crazy, 167 signatures. I just wanted to put that uh, on record, yeah. That's crazy. Your honor, it's actually gone down. A few years back, it was 250. So nabawasan na, but unfortunately, 167 is really crazy. I, I, I agree, sir. So that's, that's re the real bottleneck. There are many people who want to invest locally and foreign, even the large local conglomerates, but this is what they have to deal with. So I guess what I just want to say is that, yes, I, al I also agree with the foreign chambers. Any changes to improve, I guess, investments would be appreciated. But the lower hanging fruit or the things that can really be changed, Sana, is more in the, the bureaucracy. If, if, if your owners can do something there, that would really help in a spur more investment. Thank you for that, sir. Very much. Uh, we had a similar situation for telcos because they were complaining about the uh, number of signatures needed to obtain or to put up a cell site tower. And uh, in the Bayanihan 2 law, which we passed uh, a few years back, we placed a, although it was time bound, a time bound um, sort of emergency provision to cut the signatures uh, down. So I think we need to do that for uh, just an offhand, just thinking offhand. Thank you, Mr. Francisco. And uh, now, uh, can we hear, thank you to our friends from the private sector. Now we have uh, a whole slew of uh, government agencies. Um, we have the NEDA, USEC, Rose Edilion, and USEC, Crystal Uy have been waiting patiently, along with the DOF, the DTI, the BOI, the PESA, the ICT, and the SEC. Begging your indulgence, uh, can we hear from you, NEDA, USEC, Edilion? Thank you for waiting. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all the uh, eminent persons around this table. Uh, uh, thank you also for this opportunity really to, to discuss about this uh, economic provisions in the Constitution. So as you know, the, um, the, the Philippine Development Plan 2023 to 2028 is about transformation. And uh, uh, I, I think part of the transformation is that we have to look at, uh, you know, all those, uh, all those uh, things that could facilitate that uh, that transformation. So um, there was a there was a question on uh, we have actually opened already our economy. The thing is, uh, if you look at the uh, OECD, they, they call it the restrictiveness index. So um, although this is still a, this is a twenty sixteen uh, document. Let me see. Ah, sorry, twenty nineteen. 2019 document. So it talks about actually four uh, aspects of this uh, of this restriction. I'm just gonna point. Okay, four aspects of the restriction. The first one is to do with uh, uh, the foreign equity restrictions. The second one is to do with uh, uh, restrictions with respect to uh, the screening, the discriminatory screening, where. Uh, those coming from uh, uh, from foreign investors are actually screened differently or are applied uh, a stricter uh, screening process. And then the, the third one has to do with, uh, uh, they would say, uh, other um, other aspects of uh, of restrictiveness, like uh, um, with respect to, uh, let's say, branching, with respect to... Um, uh, they call it uh, operational uh, operational restrictions. Like uh, you cannot put up branches here. Uh, with respect also to um, uh, 
uh, own ownership of uh, of land, and then the degree of transparency, and then the discretion with respect to the granting of approvals, and then the the other one is uh, with respect to restriction on foreign personnel. So, with respect to 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 this, looking at this uh, at these four, uh, the um, and looking at the uh, the countries: Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, and Vietnam. Philippines actually comes out as uh, as the most restrictive. Uh, we will be submitting to the committee the restrictiveness with respect to uh, cert certain sectors because they looked at 22 sectors in all. And uh, it would seem that uh, uh, the Philippines is uh, most restrictive with respect to the primary sector, agriculture, fishery, forestry, uh, mining and quarrying, and then uh, some secondary sectors as well, and uh, also some uh, tertiary uh, sectors which which are on the on the services. So, and uh, of course, you would say that uh, there are other things that, and already mentioned by uh, uh, by the members in in this group, that um, there are other things that uh, actually influence the decision to invest in another country. Now, a paper by uh, Mitsura, also from the OECD. So this is 2019. He looked at uh, a panel data. So looking at 55,000 actually such uh, bilateral investments. So uh, looking at the uh, inward uh, FDI stocks and uh, controlling, controlling for the aspects of uh, let's say distance, let's say uh, the, the capacity of, uh, of the economy, looking at the GDP, looking also at the difference in the GDP, looking also at similarity in terms of language, and also if uh, the country has been a colony before and looking at so many, so in other words, controlling for the other factors. So uh, so the, the result is that uh, the restrictiveness uh, index actually is uh, still, uh, it still comes out as a, as a, as a barrier. It's uh, a barrier to, uh, I'm looking at my notes as a barrier to investment uh, with respect to uh, total foreign investments. And then, uh, yeah. And then if you look at the restriction on foreign equity, it's a barrier to the total foreign investments. If you look at the other restrictions, uh, it's a barrier to uh, the mergers and acquisition in type of investments and also the investments in uh, in services. So, so clearly there is a, a link between restrictiveness and the FDI, the, the sort of FDI flows that uh, that we receive. Now, there's also a question about the, the link between FDI and economic growth. Again, the... Uh, Again, the 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 direction of uh, of uh, causality, you know, is not really as definite as that. There are, of course, many other uh, aspects that uh, that you need to that you need to consider. But there is a, a later uh, paper also saying that it really depends on the capacity of the of the country to absorb that FDI and the kind of FDI that it is actually attracting. So, as you know. There are uh, forms of there are many objectives of FDI. So one is that it's market seeking. So if you have a big market like China, for instance, then uh, again it's a magnet for FDI. Second is that it's a uh, resource seeking. So if you already have you know the resources in place like like mining that like the minerals, then again it's a magnet for the FDI. And the third one is the kind of FDI that we want, which is efficiency seeking, because we're not really a big market. Uh, minerals were kind of still iffy on that, uh, but the efficiency seeking is really the kind of uh, the kind of FDI that we want. But this one uh, really means that uh, you know we have a very productive work, work, workforce, very competitive workforce at that. And what uh, what is being cited as a as 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 a, a determinant of this is really the quality of the education. And uh, this is, again, another aspect in the Constitution with respect to restrictiveness that we would like to you know, have more discussions about because we think that uh, this is something that, uh, that should really be, be addressed. We looked at uh, other jurisdictions with respect to education, and we see that uh, um, many of our neighbors actually have... Uh, lifted the uh, the foreign equity restrictions. Malaysia allows 100%, Vietnam allows 100%. Uh, 
Thailand, 50%. Indonesia, 49%. Singapore, 100%. Philippines, 40%. And we also look what, at... What specifically who yun, uh, you said, Rose, just for the oh, record? Sorry. Ano foreign, po yung in what? Well, in what? Uh, investment in what? Yeah, foreign ownership of uh, educational institutions. So, in uh, higher, higher education ito. Thank you. Um, actually, for Bangkok, it's open kahit, kahit ano. Uh, even uh, even basic. So, um, in the case of Singapore and also uh, Malaysia later on, um, there was that conscious, uh, that, that was a deliberate uh, effort in their case to really build a knowledge economy, to be an education hub for Asia. And so actually there was even a time that they were, uh, they were very active in poaching, uh, you know, all the good professors, whether in the Philippines or or uh, or or in other countries because they really wanted to build uh that uh, that knowledge economy and uh actually they 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 succeeded because there have been many uh branches campuses of uh, international schools that have uh, set up uh that were set up in uh, in, in the Philippines now i sorry in singapore now you might say that uh, we already passed the transnational higher education act uh, which already allows for you know exchange programs, etc. But the problem is that it did not touch on the 6040 in terms of the ownership of uh, of the foreign schools. And then uh, I also looked at the review by the British Council uh, of the higher education institutions in the Philippines, and they listed uh, actually 10, uh, 10 various provisions that they have to face if you are a foreign school. And the constitutional provision is just one of them. The other is uh, the corporation code. You have also the capitalization. You have the re national internal revenue code, etc. So ten of this. So there are, uh, as as mentioned in the OECD, when, when you talk about restrictiveness, it's not just to do with the constitution, although that's a big part. But it, there has to be a follow through uh, with respect to the to the other aspects, and so. If you are also um, in, in, with respect to investments or production processes, we have what we call a smile curve, where uh, let's say if, uh, if you draw on the vertical axis, the value added, and then on the horizontal axis is the, uh, the production process from design to uh, you know, the prototyping part up to the, then the assembly, and then let's say the, uh, the after sales service, the advertising, et cetera, et cetera. So you have that smile curve, meaning that the higher value added is really on the design part, and then also on the after sales, the advertising part. And then here in the middle, is uh, you know the assembly, but that is also where uh, where you have the 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 lowest value added, and unfortunately, that's the kind of uh, of the FDI that we have. So we are into you know we we get the raw materials, let's say for our manufacturing, and then uh, just do some uh, some additional, and then export it. So uh, and the thing is, we cannot do the design part. And it's really because uh, we have a very low, um, um, in terms of the human capital for, for the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So again, it has to do with, uh, again, uh, the lack of, uh, uh, of good uh, higher education uh, institutions. And then um, already mentioned was the, uh, uh, the, the challenge before the Supreme Court of the Philippine uh, uh, the Public Service Act, and and so we we hope that uh, this could be addressed as well, and we do hope that uh, you know as uh, as mentioned by uh, Attorney Villegas earlier that uh, we would uh, we would have the tools and also the next generation uh, would have the tools necessary to really adjust to uh, to a vocal world, and uh, oh just for the record I just want to say as well that. Uh, uh, the issue of national security is in the PDP, so it's in Chapter 13. Sayang wala na si Professor Carlos. Anyway, I also want to mention... <laughs> I also want to... Sayang wala na siya. Wala na siya. Okay, basta on the record, nandiyan siya. Okay, <laughs> hindi niya nag-google na maayos. Anyway, uh, I also want to mention that with respect to uh, the MSMEs, and this is what we we tried to... We, we actually addressed in the amendments to the RTLA, the Retail Trade Liberalization Law. 
um, that uh, in the Philippines, as you know, the MSMEs is about 99.6% of all enterprises. The micros are actually 90.5%. The small comprise 8.7% and the medium comprise 0.4%. And we think that this medium, the medium type of enterprises are really necessary for there to be you know, good competition. They're the ones that can really, you know, present uh, that can scale up and present that challenge to the to the large ones, so that they don't have that uh, uh, that uh, dominant power. At the same time, that they can actually uh, they can actually have uh, more of the backward linkage uh, coming from the micro and the small. Um, when COVID actually uh, actually COVID. Um, we had COVID. And uh, what happened was uh, the total number of enterprises, to be fair, actually went up from 20, what it was in 2019, all the way to 2022. But uh, it was actually the micro enterprises that increased. The small enterprises declined by 11%, and then the medium scale enterprises declined by 9%. And that is why in the amended uh, RTLA, we made sure that uh, you know the 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 threshold actually does not include the the, the medium, so that we can allow uh, foreign investments into the medium scale enterprises because this is uh, what we think will you know is, is something that uh, that could could lend dynamism to uh, to our to our enterprises. Um, I think that this. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll stop there so that uh, the other uh, the other members of uh, the executive can uh, can also discuss. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank Mr. you. Chair. Uh, a lot of good points there. I just like to sorry with your indulgence, uh, Santa Teresa. Just we'll ask for more information on the smile curve and on the uh, that what well, your point about the medium. Uh, just to clarify, just some clarifications. We'll, we'll I'll have my staff do it to you, not to take up the time of the subcommittee, Santa Teresa. Salamat, Chair. Just uh, one quick follow-up question at this point. Dahil binanggit po ni Yusek Rosemary yung um, Philippine Development Plan. Uh, tama po ba na sa Philippine Development Plan 2023 to 2028, wala namang pagbanggit na kailangang amyendahan yung Constitution? Uh, uh, tama po na wala. And, and that's really because, uh, you know, we, we have to... Uh, uh, Kumbaga, yun ay yun yung constraint namin. It's an initial condition. It's a, sorry, it's an initial condition? Initial condition. But uh, in any case, for me, it was uh, just a uh, question of fact. So salamat dun sa confirmation na nung binubuo ng NEDA, ng National Economic Development Authority, ang Philippine Development Plan, binubuo ng buong administrasyon kasi ang chair ng NEDA ay si Presidente mismo, uh, to bring our country from where we are now, economically, development-wise, to yung vision nila by 2028. Six years na makamit yung development targets natin, maka, makamit yung pati yung sustainable development goals. Sa dinami-dami ng kinonsider dyan na pangangailangan, problema, at potential at mga targets talaga, hindi talaga nakita na kakailanganin yung charter change. So i just like to uh, make that of record, Mr. Chair. Salamat po. Thank you, Dr. Teresa. Um, you're done, no, Yusek? Uh, how about Yusek? Uy, is anything to add? Wala na po, wala na po. Okay. DOF, Yusek Agamin, sir. Good afternoon, Chair, uh, members of the Honorable Commission. Um, uh, first of all, my principal, Secretary Recto, sends his apologies for uh, as he will not be able to make it to these meetings. But we've had uh, an opportunity to discuss the matter at hand. And um, based on our discussion, Chair, his inputs will be, of course, we are echoing the position of the President to consider the um, uh, economic provisions of the Constitution so that uh, certain sectors of the economy are opened up. Second, as stated by the other speakers as well, the provisions restricting the ownership on mass media, advertising, education um, should be uh, lifted as well. And third, um, 
we are cognizant of the laws passed recently by um, this Congress opening up the uh, um, certain economic activities, the Public Service Act, the Retail Trade Nationalization Act, and Foreign Investments Act. And uh, while the discussion is going on with respect to uh, whether the amendment should be done or not, we will be working hard to implement the provisions and to get um, as much investments as we can in the meantime. So that will be our statement, Chair, for this purpose. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Yusei Kagawin. But we would appreciate uh, if you could, along the way, maybe uh, furnish us more data, data-driven uh, analysis. Because uh, uh, you have uh, all these whole uh, people working for you to research these things. You've been done doing it for some time now. Yes, so sir. from you, NEDA, DTI, and the, and the other uh, investment promotion agencies, we would uh, appreciate some of that. Because there are a lot of people who are really skeptical mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the Senate, uh, whether uh, this is the right move, uh, and uh, as you know, we we require a uh, three fourths vote of, of all the senators. Yes, so sir. that's a that's a hurdle we must uh, a practical hurdle we have to uh, overcome. Yes, Thank sir. you. We Thank we you. actually have chair, um, except it's been cited already. We are the most restrictive in ASEAN based on OECD study, but that's a twenty twenty study. I wonder how we will rate considering the recent amendments done. That's one. Second. Um, as stated as well by the other speakers, we are lagging behind our ASEAN peers when, respect, when it comes to foreign investments. We, we are even behind Vietnam. Um, uh, third, um, of course, we cannot pinpoint it exclusively. Our lagging behind in investments, we cannot pinpoint exclusively to the economic provisions. Again, there is the issue of power, which has been stated by the other speakers. Um, uh, red tape, and of course, um, governance principles. But we'll be glad to prepare a letter as well, um, citing those uh, figures, Mr. Chair. We'll appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, can you hear from, yeah, Senator Tolentino. Uh, Yusek, Yusek Agabin, are you the son of Professor Agabin? Uh, yes, Chair. Give my regards to your dad. We've been discussing the Philippine Constitution <laughs> years and years ago. We we'll do, Chair. Thank you. Please also, he's my, he was my professor at the UP. Thank you. He was our dean, actually, actually at the College of Law. Thank you. Um, DTI, Yusek, uh, Rafaelita Aldaba, ma'am. I understand you have a presentation. Can we ask the committee secretariat? Yeah. Hi, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and to the honorable members of uh, the Senate committee. Yes, we, ha we have a presentation, and uh, the title of which is uh, Services Liberalization, an Unfinished Agenda. There are four, um, next slide, please. There are four um, <laughs> main highlights that uh, I would like to share. Number one um, is the analytical framework, um, which uh, we think is important to provide context in our discussions. Um, it provides us an integrated approach to services liberalization, to growth and uh, development. And then um, I uh, would also want to show the impact uh, of uh, the previous services reforms carried out in the 90s, especially on FDI inflows and a comparative FDI analysis of uh, the Philippines versus our ASEAN neighbors. And uh, third point would be uh, on our unfinished reform agenda. Why do we need to liberalize services? And then lastly, um, some strategic directions. We'd like to share uh, the Philippine Services Roadmap for Transformation, Growth, and Innovation. In the next slide, uh, this is uh, our uh, framework. It looks at the various host country determinants of uh, FDI, and primarily there are three. One is the policy framework, top of which would be rules regarding entry and operations, along with standards of treatment of uh, foreign affiliates. And then you have the economic. Under economic, uh, these are based on the various motives uh, of uh, multinationals in uh, locating in a particular country. Yusek Rose already mentioned this, market seeking, resource seeking, efficiency seeking, and asset seeking. And for each um, motivation, there are different sets of um, economic determinants. And uh, the second one would, uh, the third one would be on business facilitation. So 
this would cover um, a lot of the things that uh, we've also been uh, discussing, but uh, I'd like to mention investment incentives, for instance, um, hassle costs related to corruption, bureaucratic inefficiency, and so on. In the next slide, um, okay, so uh, from a highly restrictive and complicated investment regime, uh, the Philippines adopted a more open FDI strategy and services reforms beginning in 1991. So that was through the Foreign Investment Act, wherein we liberalized uh, foreign equity participation up to 100% in all areas not specified in the foreign investment negative list. And um, then this was followed by the foreign bank liberalization in 1994, which provided a seven year window allowing foreign banks to own up to 100%. And then the retail trade liberalization, but still uh, restrictions remained in uh, many of the services uh, sectors. And um, recently we passed, of course, the PSA, the RTLA, and some uh, amendments as well in the Foreign Investment Negative Act. And um, next slide, please. So um, the next slide, uh, services liberalization has not been sustained. Um, still, we have all these uh, restrictions. No foreign equity is allowed in mass media practice of all professions, cooperatives, small-scale mining, utilization of marine resources, uh, including ownership, operation of cockpits, and then manufacture and repair, stockpiling of nuclear weapons, biological, chemical, and radiological weapons, and the manufacture of firecrackers and pyrotechnic devices. Um, up to 25% up to is allowed uh, for private recruitment, 30% for advertising, and only up to 40% for the procurement of infrastructure projects, exploration, development, and utilization of natural resources, land ownership, operation of public utilities, educational institutions, culture, production, milling, processing, trading, except retailing of rice and corn, and so on. In the next slide, so uh, with all the, with all the uh, reforms carried out initially, as you can see on the slide, um, this has uh, led to improvements in FDI flows, as you can see on the slide. An average annual change in our cumulative FDI inflows actually increased from 12% in the 90s to 86% in uh, the period 2000 to 2000, 2009, but this slowed down to 18% in 2010 to 2019. And on the average, FDI as percentage of GDP also went up from 0.47 in 1970 to 1989 to 1.5% 1 in 1990 to, to 2009 and almost 2% in 2010 up to 2022. In the next slide, this gives us the structure of um, FDI inflows to the country. And um, as you can see, there are two charts. Uh, one is for 2010 to 2015 and the other one is from 2016 to 2022. And um, in both uh, periods, manufacturing consistently dominated the bulk of our FDI inflows. And um, if you recall, manufacturing has already been liberalized, uh, except for a few sectors, which were, uh, which were mentioned earlier. But um, uh, th there's been a slight reduction uh, from 29% in 2010 to 2015 to 28%. Uh, uh, during the during the period 2016 to 2022, but you can see some uh, some changes, and in particular, uh, higher FDI inflows are actually going to those sectors that we opened up, like for instance, financial and insurance at 17.88 percent, and uh, this actually went up to 20 percent uh, during the uh, second period. And at the same time, uh, we also see uh, real estate at 14% share, um, and then wholesale and retail at 8%, water supply, sewerage, 7%, mining at 5%, information and communication with 5%, and arts and entertainment at 5%. For the 2016 to 2022, we see a big increase in the share of electricity, gas, and steam, now with a share accounting for 22% of the total. And um, real estate actually fell to 8%. Information and communication also fell from 5 to 4 Arts and entertainment maintained its share at 
In the next slide, um, I think this was already pointed out earlier that um, while, of course, there have been inflows coming in, but uh, when we compare ourselves uh, with the performance of our neighbors, <coughs> we see that uh, um, FDI uh, performance of the Philippines has been limited. And um, the, the, the figures won't lie. And um, in particular, I'd like to point out that um, be to, uh, if we compare Philippines and Vietnam, for instance, for the period 1990 to 1999, we have almost the same cumulative FDI stock at 12 billion USD for Philippines and 13 billion for Vietnam. In the succeeding periods, uh, Philippines went up to 16 during 2000 to 2009, while Vietnam substantially jumped to 36 billion. And um, in the more recent period from 2010 to 2019, Philippines went up from 16 to 45, Vietnam from 36 to 112 billion US dollars. And um, in the next slide, I'm also utilizing the same tool, which has uh, already been mentioned, and this is the OECD FDI Regulatory Restrictiveness Index. So it's from uh, it's a uh, measurement from zero to one, and the lower the figure, the the more uh, open the country is, and the higher it is, the closer it, the figure is to one, the more restrictive the country um, is. In the next slide, um, again, this was already shown earlier, so uh, I'm uh, going to skip it. I, I, I just say that uh, we, the Philippines, and uh, together with Indonesia, Thailand, and Malaysia, we are among the most restrictive countries uh, uh, with respect to uh, FDI. And um, now let me go deeper. Um, next slide, please. In, in this, uh, in this uh, slide, we look at FDI restrictions in ASEAN. And as you can see, primarily, um, these are high in services as well as in primary sectors. Um, manufacturing, as you can see, is already uh, uh, has very low uh, FDI restrictions, both in the OECD countries as well as in ASEAN. Um, but again, um, the Philippines is the most restrictive in ASEAN, and you can see that in the in the uh, uh, chart to, uh, to to the right. And um, in particular, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, sec. I'm just wondering. Uh, I'm looking at the last two two charts you presented. What exactly are we measuring here when we see these uh, decimal points? What are we referring to? Point five. What is that? What does that refer to? These are these are the. Um, Index uh, indexes, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the OECD uh, regulatory restrictiveness uh, index, which, uh, as mentioned, the figure would raise between zero and one. If uh, uh, at zero, of course, that means you're open, and the higher the number is, the more restrictive you are. So these are uh, the numbers. It's based on an internal scorecard. Uh, yeah, yes, Mr. Chair. Okay. So. For the Philippines, it's around 0.4. If you look at the chart to the left, that's our FDI regulatory restrictiveness index um, for 2019. And um, you, you can see um, the various uh, sub subsectors inside the, the restrictiveness index covering primary sectors. And then the gray part, that would be for manufacturing. And then services would be the light blue one. I think we have to take a step back, Yusek and uh, Yusek Rose, and, and present uh, what are the metrics here because Marami Samin are not familiar with the, the metrics. No? So if you could furnish that so I can share it with my colleagues. Para, I, I understand the whole philosophy, no? but, but that how, how they actually arrive at the rankings, I'm not too sure. Thank you. Please continue. Yeah, these are scores, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, actually, uh, the, I, I have a slide containing the... A description of the measurement. Did that uh, uh, in it, order, otherwise, uh, yes, we, yes, we, we yeah, we, we'll ask for it. I, I think I think it, it it's it's useful, no? Pero yun nga, eh, baka, uh, it's a block, a stumbling block to our further understanding if we do not understand how these scores were arrived at. Thank you. I I uh, actually it's in here. I skipped it in the interest of time, um, but uh, it, it it's uh, it, it's in the deck, uh, Mr. Chair. So uh, may I proceed, Mr. Chair? Yes, please, please, please do. So um, in the next slide, again, 
uh, this was also pointed out by Yusek <coughs> Rose earlier, there is a negative correlation between FDI performance and these uh, regulatory restrictions. And um, the, of course, the more open you are, the higher uh, the FDI inflows and uh, the, the more restrictive, the lower your uh, FDI uh, is. But um, although, of course, um, there may be some questions with respect to the strength of this relationship, but uh, what uh, these figures tell us is that uh, the relationship holds across time, across many individual countries, and that foreign investors respond to reforms, particularly after a critical mass of reforms uh, has been reached. And uh, next slide. Again, in here, uh, Mr. Chair, we are tracing the OECD FDI Regulatory Restrictiveness Index among uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, and Vietnam. And as you can see, in 1985, Vietnam actually was the most restrictive among the four countries. And the, Vietnam is followed by Indonesia, and then Philippines, and then you have uh, Malaysia. But after 2005, the Philippines has the most restrictive regulatory environment in ASEAN. And that was because the three other countries were quite fast in terms of removing these restrictions. And so uh, 26, by 2016, uh, we, uh, the Philippines already uh, became the most restrictive uh, country with respect to FDI among the four uh, ASEAN uh, member countries not counting Singapore, <laughs> so. Okay, so in the next slide, um, again, um, just to further emphasize this point, um, we uh, try looking at each individual country. We have Indonesia, we have Malaysia, Vietnam, and uh, Philippines. And again, we uh, try the mapping. We, we, we looked at both uh, the, F, the restrictive death index and um, their FDI uh, inflows, inward stock, uh, as percentage of GDP. And again, it's the same, um, the same message. Low FDI restrictiveness index is associated with high FDI inward stock as percentage of GDP. And um, if you look at Vietnam, that's uh, the second chart uh, to the left. Um, Vietnam, actually, as you can see on the slide, um, it, uh, it's uh, FDI index declined steadily from 1985 to 2015, such that uh, by 2015, its FDI stock as percentage of GDP was already at 50%. As compared to the Philippines, for example, uh, during the same year, our figure is only 20%. And um, in terms of its uh, FDI restrictiveness index for Vietnam, it's around 0.1. For the Philippines, it's at uh, it's at point 0.4, okay? And uh, next slide. Looking into the future, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm sharing this slide just so we can uh, um, take a, have a look at uh, what the future, what the future is in terms of the top six FDI trends. And um, based on this uh, trends, what we can see is that Asia Pacific has remained a desirable location for investors. And for us to be able to take advantage of these future opportunities, it's really important for us to reduce the regulatory restrictions um, in order for us to harness, for example, the resilient growth in greenfield FDI, which is expected to increase um, in, the future, in the very near future. Sub-regional success, Southeast Asia is leading with 120 billion inward um, investments, but we note that in the East and Northeast Asia, they're growing by 148%. And then India, of course, remains on top with 68 billion mega deals in communications, software, semiconductors, auto, biomass, uh, power. Um, and in terms of interregional FDI, largest sources still. Uh, Chi are still uh, China, 65%, and Japan with 12%. Magnetism of metals, and the uh, Philippines has uh, a lot of me minerals. Uh, and then this is actually second after renewable energy. And inverse investor's choice, it's still Asia Pacific, 
for talent for our talent pool, technology, innovation ecosystems, and industry clusters over uh, tra the traditional cost uh, considerations. And um, in the next slide, um, I would also want to highlight that FDI in renewables uh, are expected to increase in the wake of the liberalization of FDI ownership restrictions. And uh, we already uh, covered um, the, the reforms earlier. And let me also point out the investments made by Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners, which was the first foreign investor to be awarded 100% ownership rights in offshore wind. Um, they invested in three wind farms with total capacity of two gigawatts, generating 4,500 jobs, along with power for one million households. And let me also note that uh, uh, based on our discussions with the embassy, they are also going to manufacture the turbines and the other um, uh, the other equipment needed for uh, their offshore uh, wind uh, investments. There were also nine Chinese companies, uh, including state-owned China General Nuclear Power Group and wind turbine manufacturer Mingyang Wind Power uh, that pledged to invest 13.7 billion US dollars in renewable energy, energy storage systems, and off-grid power systems. Now, in the next slide, this is the the smile curve of music, of music <laughs> rose uh, earlier. And as you can see, um, the value addition, the vertical, that vertical axis is measuring value added, Mr. Chair. And um, what uh, the, the main message here is that value addition and potential profits are greatest in services as compared to manufacturing. Manufacturing is that one um, at the bottom. And, um, uh, these are highest, value added is, high, is ha the high, highest in R&D services, in innovation, in design, marketing, branding, and um, after sales services. And in order for us to maximize our economic gains uh, that would arise from a potential liberalization of the services sector, we need to invest in the high value stages of the supply chain apart from manufacturing. And we need to create, to do that, we need to create an environment where companies can move up the value chain. We need investments in education, in infrastructure, and innovation ecosystems. In the next slide, um, um, I'm not sure whether this has been mentioned by the other speakers, but while services account for 60% of our GDP and 57% of total employment, in terms of labor productivity, um, this has remained low, and this is evident from the slide. It's low, not only in comparison with other sectors in our internal, in our domestic economy, but even if, if we compare it with other uh, uh, countries, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, we're still behind. We're uh, slightly above Vietnam and Cambodia in terms of our services, labor productivity. And um, in the next slide, uh, let me also uh, highlight this, Mr. Chair. Um, in the more than 47, or in the more than 40 roadmaps that uh, we formulated together with the private sector, um, the 60-40% foreign equity rule has been mentioned as one of the most binding constraints to growth. Next slide. So um, why do we need to liberalize um, services? Like what I've said, we need to complete, uh, completing the uh, li services liberalization would be crucial. Services is key for growth, competitiveness, and jobs. And opening services, uh, FDI, can boost productivity across economic sectors and benefit um, micro, small, and medium enterprises in particular. In the next slide, um, this is our vision uh, for uh, the services industry. We want to grow more globally competitive and innovative services sector that would create more quality jobs, move up the value chain, and enable our structural uh, transformation. The strategic actions are um, the following. Um, we need uh, human capital development and infrastructure support, and crucial here would be investments in education and training, technological and digital, physical, as well as legal infrastructure. 
um, trade, investment, and industrial policy that would promote services that harness global value chain potentials. And the Tatak Pinoy strategy would play a crucial role in uh, achieving this, Mr. Chair. Supply chain integration of services, manufacturing, and agriculture. We also need regulatory and institutional frameworks. We have um, uh, what we are recommending is a gradual liberalization uh, of the services sector to allow industries to adjust, along with uh, a strong implementation of our competition law and policy. And lastly, technology adoption and innovation ecosystem, which would improve productivity and service delivery of the, uh, of the sector. In the next slide, we also identified the various uh, uh, activities um, that are needed in uh, building our infrastructure ecosystem to promote the services sector, given that it is the glue that binds together our economic sectors. Um, I wouldn't mention uh, all of this, uh, Mr. Chair, but uh, suffice it to say that we have, we have a plan and we have identified where investments uh, would be crucial in order for us to successfully achieve our goals and vision uh, for the industry. And um, in the next slide, we've also uh, highlighted those services sectors where uh, the Philippines has both revealed and potential comparative advantage. Number one, of course, we have a pool of skilled, semi-skilled, highly skilled, uh, workers, which are our main source of strength and the drivers of our services exports. We have um, the ITBPM, IC design, business services, the creative, R&D, ship repair, infra services, energy, uh, and so on. And let me end, Mr. Chair, um, in the next slide, please, by uh, uh, Quoting our uh, secretary, Fred Pasqual, DTI stands with a call to amend the, the economic provisions of the 1987 Philippine Constitution. This is not a call for relinquishing our national interests, but rather a strategy to align with the inevitable global economic currents. It is a call for practicality, openness, and strategic action to empower the Philippine economy to reach its full potential. Thank you. That's a very good presentation on the part of uh, DTI. Thank you. Uh, my bladder is telling me that uh, we've gone over three hours straight. So if we could, uh, Justice, yes, uh, then we'll have a five-minute break. Uh, go ahead, uh, Justice. Just a comment, uh, Mrs. Chair. Uh, I do not think we have to change a single word, word of the Constitution to open up our services industry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, you said Fita will just ask for more information on you said that when you were uh, conducting your 40 or so roadmaps for industries, you many cited the constitutional provisions as binding constraints. Could we ask for more details on that later on? Thank you. Uh, the chair will just call a five minute break with the permissions and Risa because uh, we've gone over three hours uh, without a break. So it's a five minute health break. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, uh, Mr. Payne, yeah, you wanted to say something? Uh, just a very brief comment. Uh, I think we focus a lot on the volume of FDR. It, we should never forget that the other two parts are competition, which make us internationally competitive, and secondly, innovation. We need to innovate constantly to stay internationally competitive and indeed for our citizens to benefit from what is internationally. So, so I would stress that when we talk about easing restrictions on, on ODI, uh, FDI, we are also talking about importing innovation. We're talking about being competitive. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And I would add to that, uh, uh, to our economic team, maybe we could plot the graphs of uh, GDP per capita, because I think that's that's uh, that rather than just uh, the volume of foreign direct investment, it, it's the actual impact on uh, incomes and maybe employment. If you have uh, graphs that you could plot against the FDI and the, because, you know, you, you've you've said that uh, Thailand and Malaysia are among and the Philippines are among the most restrictive uh, in terms of foreign direct investment, but we we're lagging behind those countries in terms of incomes. You know, Vietnam is more open, but we're more aligned to them in terms of incomes. So so there's a, there's some somewhat of a disconnect there. I think we need to see more data to to complete the picture. You know, like like why is Malaysia much higher 
uh, than us. Of course, uh, the answer is probably, you know, we suspect it's because they, they have better and stronger and more competitive local industries. No, That's why we're pushing for the top Pinoy. But I think we need the empirical data to support the assertions. Thank you. I will come back in five minutes.
Uh, thank. We'd like to thank uh, everyone who's uh, patiently stayed with us for over three hours and uh, with the assurance that we are nearing the finish line. <laughs> we have four more resource persons to hear from. Uh, Santa Risa, just the BOI, the PESA, the DICT, and the SEC. So uh, are they are they here? Uh, BOI, Governor Marjorie Samaniego. Ma'am, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, honorable members of the Senate and uh, to our eminent guest. Uh, Mr. Chair, we echo what the uh, USEC FITA has, is, uh, has presented and stated, and of course, what our secretary has, uh, has uh, declared. Uh, essentially, Mr. Chair, we are proposing as well for the amendment of the economic provisions of the Constitution. And uh, the approach, Mr. Chairman, is similar to what was proposed under the uh, resolution of both houses, entitled Resolution of Both Houses Proposing Amendments to Certain Economic Provisions of the 1987 uh, Constitution, thereby uh, this would not be a self-executing uh, provision, but will require another enabling law for purposes of uh, the opening up of the sector, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Uh, that would be all for now, Mr. Chair. And uh, for the official position of the DTI, we'll just uh, respectfully submit it, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Governor Samaniego. Uh, for PESA, OIC Deputy Director General Jenny June Romero. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. Thank you for waiting. Uh, um. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, and to all the honorable members of this committee. And uh, we thank you for inviting PESA to this uh, committee hearing. Um, Your Honors, as an investment promotion agency, uh, we are open. We are open and we support uh, initiatives uh, aimed at uh, making our country the premier investment destination and uh, uh, improving our rank uh, in investment uh, attraction of uh, foreign direct investments. And we also share uh, the positions of uh, DTI and BOI as being part of the DTI family. And uh, we agree, Your Honors, that uh, these initiatives uh, must be uh, well-studied, uh, well-researched, not rushed. And uh, also, this has to be targeted so that they will just provide solutions to critical problems that is ailing our ability to attract foreign investments. Uh, we at PESA, uh, Your Honors, we are allowed to register corporations which are 100% uh, owned by <laughs> foreigners for as long as the, comp the activity that they will be engaging in are registered in the SIPP. And of course, it will be um, subject to the laws on uh, uh, nationalized activities under the Constitution and uh, uh, similar laws, Your Honors. I will be submitting our comments uh, in the next few days. Thank you very Thank much, you. Uh, uh, DDG Romero. We'd like to acknowledge the presence of Senator Bato de la Rosa, the Senate Chair of uh, Committee on Public Order. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, so now we have the ICT, uh, ASEC Paraiso. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Uh, first and foremost, in behalf of our Secretary, Secretary Ivan Uy, we would like to thank this uh, honorable committee for inviting the ICT. We are honored to be here. Uh, we support the call of the President to visit, revisit uh, the possible amendments to the economic provisions of the government. To illustrate, sir, uh, we note that there are several innovations that have been legislated already, particularly the Public Service Act, which uh, uh, now considers ICT as not part of a uh, public utility, thus opening it up to 100% um, uh, foreign investments. The passage of uh, EO number 32, which streamlines the telecom uh, industry towers, uh, which addresses uh, one of the re points raised by Mr. Francisco earlier, that there is a problem or a low-lying fruit that we can address is the problem of uh, bureaucratic efficiency. Um, now, but with these passages of this, this particular legislation, it also poses several challenges. For example, in the PSA, it does not solve the problem of the very restrictive need for congressional franchises when it comes to the telecoms industry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there is a pending bill before the Senate with regards to the Open Access Act. I know this is a very, very uh, contentious uh, uh, requirement, and uh, you know, 
uh, which can be probably which would probably aid in our deliberations when it comes to uh, constitutional amendments, sir. Uh, also, when it comes to um, while well, government needs vital infrastructures to improve connectivity and digitalization, uh, there's also a need to liberalize or revisit the provisions of the public procurement law because it's very restrictive when it comes to the ICT industry. Um, a very good point raised by um, uh, Chairman Aguinaldo earlier was results can only uh, would be best in the best indications of a law, whether a law is effective or not, would be the results. But since the PSA and EO number 32 are very, very new laws, uh, it is, you know, it is very inefficient or it's not right to judge the law's efficiency uh, at this point in time. But I guess it's an improvement since uh, based on the latest uh, reports of the BOI, the ICT industry is probably top two in the FBIs that uh, have uh, come into the country. Um, if the goal is for investments, I pro we guess that the law is efficient. It's probably working. But if the goal is to improve the lives of the Filipinos, it remains to be seen, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the, the committee. But for sure, this is this, this one thing is for sure, we can do better. So uh, at least on the part of the ICT industry. So with that, Mr. Chair, we thank you, sir. I want to clarify, you're saying... Uh... The improve uh, changing the constitution, uh, the the positive effects remain to be seen on the on for the for the Filipino people. No, sir. Uh, oh, with regards to I the, just, I just want the, to clarify that remark. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. The passage of the legislation, particularly the the PSA, because it's a fairly new law, sir. Uh, again, um, uh, then see muna tayo. It's it's uh, not not definite if there it will result in benefits. Is what is your point? Yes, Mr. Okay. Chair. Thank Got you, it. Mr. Got Chair. It. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Asak Parizo. And uh, can we hear from Attorney Gerardo del Rosario from the SEC or Securities Exchange Commission? Attorney. A pleasant good afternoon, Mr. Chair and the member of the committee. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, say thank you for inviting the SEC in, to join in this conference, in this meeting. Uh, from the viewpoint of company registration, Mr. Chair, uh, the amendments to the Foreign Investment Act, uh, the amendments to the negative list, as well as the uh, amendment to the Public Service Act, is a welcome development for the SEC. Uh, we will be implementing the laws that will be passed by the Congress. Uh, we're open to the, we're happy that our economy is being opened because we're be giving a opportunity to the foreigners to provide investment in the Philippines and it's equivalent to uh, employment opportunity for our Kababayans. And uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to emphasize the, what Mr. Uh, Francisco uh, said a while ago, that uh, there's a need for a lot of signature. In the SEC, uh, registration bears no more signature. 93% uh, of our registration bears no signature by the director. The only remaining uh, with signature, which is only one signature, is the signature for the uh, approval of partnership and uh, branch offices. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, commendable on the part of the SEC. Uh, pero yung, yung, you still need the signatures to file the, the compliance requirements, di ba? Yes, sir. Yeah. In oh. fact, uh, we will be launching a project which is a so-called uh, credentialing. Yeah. So how fast can you form a uh, juridical body or a corporation nowadays? Well, sir, we have okay. a so-called one yeah. sec, a one day. One day, one, one day. day. Kaya na. Okay. Oh. That's because of the new corporation code, di ba? Yes, sir. But, uh, 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 may uh, restriction. Hindi naman restriction, but uh, we can only cater to 100% Filipino right, company. Right. Uh, the basic corporations, you know, uh, holdings, okay. manufacturing. Anong requirement nyo pag 60-40? Ipag may foreign uh, ownership? What is the compliance or regulatory requirement there? Nothing, sir. Nothing? Just, just the, the filing of the of articles the, of incorporation? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's it for our resource persons. Uh, I'll turn it over to my colleagues for their questions. And Teresa, thank you for waiting patiently. Uh, you have 10 minutes then, Senator Bato, afterwards, if you wish us. Yeah. Go ahead, ma'am. Salamat, uh, Mr. Chair. So I think some of our resource persons uh, took the uh, health break as a permanent break. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of go, which, actually, go ahead. <laughs> That's okay. reason. So we were, we were, well, we still have very good resource persons oh, here well. in the person of our uh, uh, economic agencies. Go ahead, ma'am. Definitely. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Actually, yung una kong uh, tanong sana kay uh, Justice Scarpio, but maybe for the next hearing, if uh, if he will be with us. If you can send him your questions, ma'am, if you wish, if you wish. Yeah. 
Salamat, Chair. Um, siguro, uh, on the legitimacy of the need for RBH6, uh, I was going to ask this to uh, Sek Balisakan, but after hearing the presentation of Dr. Angeles, sir, if I could ask uh, this question of you. Uh, in 2019, uh, a deputy ombudsman said that, uh, estimated that uh, we lose 700 billion pesos or 20% uh, of government's budget to uh, what what are stolen no, from from the coffers of of government of the country due to corruption and based on the corruption perceptions index we're still in the top third uh, the philippines uh, of the most corrupt countries in the world and in many other studies on corruption uh, that corruption is still uh, a big deterrent on the foreign direct investment. So, hindi kaya mas importanteng pagtuunan ito ng pansin, combating uh, corruption, uh, even uh, more than uh, amending the Constitution. Um, thank you for that question, ma'am. Um, I perhaps, uh, rather, perhaps one can take note of the studies that Yusek uh, Edelion and I think um, also Professor uh, Fabella and uh, their colleagues drafted. Um, I suppose one way of thinking of it is uh, we need not, uh, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can address both at the same time. Um, and uh, I believe the studies also show that uh, removing uh, these restrictions Tetris paribus is also beneficial. Certainly, addressing the corrupt, um, corruption, red tape, and so on are also going to be beneficial. Thank you, uh, Dr. Angeles. Salamat. Salamat po. Uh, Mr. Chair, moving on to, uh, if I may, although it's, uh, it's not the specific subject of RBH6, not one of the, but I think there are lessons we can learn from just... Uh, a few questions about energy generation and distribution. Okay. Uh, so since uh, uh, you said Rosemary is here with us, ma'am, if you could uh, feel these questions uh, or, or refer to one of your colleagues from NEDA uh, for these. Uh, in the energy transmission and distribution sector uh, for electricity, 40% uh, is owned by the State Grid Corporation of China. And our Senate Committee on Energy uh, learned that uh, they have a veto power because of this 40% ownership uh, in the NGCP. Same goes for Meralco, 43% uh, is owned uh, by foreign interests. So, and we know that um, uh, Meralco and NGCP are not lacking for profits, and uh, these profits can be uh, invested so that we don't anymore suffer uh, the blackouts also mentioned by a resource persons recently on Panay Island, uh, on Guimaras Island as well, before that uh, on Mindoro Island. Um, and so that uh, we can modernize uh, our grid and uh, make it even more ready and capable for the entry of renewable energy supplies uh, in the coming years. So, mas bibilis po ba yung pagbagsak ng presyo ng kuryente? Mas maaasahan ba natin? yung pagkakaroon ng no blackout, uh, renewable energy ready na grid at saka distribution system. At mas titibay din ba tayo laban sa mga cyber threats uh, kung mas maraming dayuhan ang magpapasok ng kapital o kung yung China State Grid Corporation mismo at yung Salim Group ang magiging controlling shareholders sa dalawang kumpanyang iyon, NGCP at sa Cameralco. Uh, yeah, Madam Chair, I'm not an engineer, so. <laughs> and if, just uh, if, say, if, then if the NEDA has any thoughts about these yeah, questions, yeah. No, just not on say, the technical level, but yes, more yes. of the policy level. Yeah, part. more on the policy level. I think, uh, uh, as as would any reform, no, kailangan kompleto talaga. Uh, so with respect to the reform in the in the power sector, uh, what we have been uh, ad pushing for as well is. Uh, improve the capacity of the ERC, the Energy Regulatory Commission, kasi sila yung dapat na nagsa-safeguard ng, uh, ng ating, ano, ng ating interest. At the same time, kung, kung sa, ano naman, kung sa, uh, sa ICT, so it's your NTC. And this is also why 
we also mentioned that uh, uh, as, as we're going digital, we really need to beef up our capacity to do cybersecurity. And, a, and uh, a big part of that is really our human resource. So kailangan natin mag-produce ng more than halos 200,000 dapat na license na cybersecurity of which we only have less than 200, I, I believe. So, so, so ganong, ano, ganong tipo na it doesn't have to be, you know, just one bullet uh, addressing all the problems. Uh, dapat marami tayong, ano, kasi iba-iba yung, ano, iba-iba yung problema. So, just to say that, uh, uh, yun nga, we, uh, we really need to beef up the capacity of, uh, of the regulators themselves. Uh, uh, as to the other points, Madam Chair, I, I will uh, just relay it to ano, my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Yusek uh, Rosemary. Before I continue with my questions for Neda, dahil nabanggit na rin po yung cybersecurity, if Mr. Chai could ask the representative from uh, the DICT, I think ASIC para ISO. Yes, sir. Uh, ngayon pa lang po, um, so many vulnerabilities uh, are emerging as to our cybersecurity, uh, witness the, the recent cyber attacks. Uh, hindi po ba nangangamba yung department na yung pagbukas sa dayuhan ng public utilities, pati posibleng no? critical infrastructure, uh, and I have other questions about this for other resource persons, hindi kaya nakakapangamba na magdadala ng dagdag na panganib sa national security natin? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, there's always that possibility. There's always that fear. But with the passage, the passage and the approval of the President of the National Cybersecurity Plan, comes with it our uh, uh, the improvement uh, and the plan to uh, beef up as our colleagues were saying the cybersecurity capacity and uh, posturing of our nation at the heart of it is as mentioned is the upskilling and training of various cybersecurity and IT professionals in government uh, hopefully uh, we can also address the need uh, to meet the disparity of uh, wages in uh, uh, government employees working as cybersecurity professionals and IT professionals. Uh, but to answer the question, there's always that possibility. But again, uh, the DICT in particular is not lacking in foresight uh, when it comes to uh, you know, address it, uh, knowing the problem and trying to address it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And in uh, filling up the plantilla that uh, Yusek Rosemary mentioned, uh, 2,000, uh, sorry, 200,000 um, personnel for our cybersecurity, uh, wouldn't it be the better part of wisdom na the ownership uh, remains uh, in Filipino hands? Uh, we would like to... Uh, we can only address the problem of the lack of cybersecurity professionals, Your Honors, Mr. Chair. But uh, the wisdom of whether those industries should belong in Filipino hands, uh, even if it would uh, create or it would uh, create the possibility of uh, cybersecurity threats, uh, we leave it up to the legislature and the other uh, agencies in government uh, whether that possibility or that risk is greater than the investments and the benefits it would. Uh, bring to the Filipino people. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, salamat. Of course, Congress always appreciates uh, the kind of respect for the institution, pero kaya rin po kayo iniimbita bilang resource persons because uh, we also value the input you give us. Uh, and I'm sure and I hope that the good secretary is also advising the president about this dahil ngayon pa lang na kapapasalang palanga ng National Cyber Security Plan na problema na nga tayo sa mga cyber attacks na iyan. So all the more uh, moving forward, we want to uh, not just address uh, reactively, but even um, anticipate or preempt uh, additional uh, threats in the future, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, rest assured, Mr. Chair, you have a very progressive, very forward-looking uh, head of the DICT advising the president on the mat on matters of cybersecurity, the problem the problem it uh, poses, and the solutions that we can adopt to address those problems. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, going back now to uh, NEDA, mm, it's been, as some of our resource persons have mentioned, it's been more than two decades that our power generation sector in the country has been open uh, for 100% uh, foreign ownership. So, ano po kaya yung pumipigil pa sa dayuang kapital na magpundar 
uh, ng mas maraming kapital sa power generation sector natin nitong nakaraang dalawang dekada. If uh, Yusek Rosemary or, or one of her colleagues would care to uh, address the question. Chair, if I may. Um, yes, please. The, I think the most common reason is the, again, stated by our, um, our representatives from the Joint Chambers of Commerce, the permitting process, it takes a really, really long time to get the permits off the ground. In fact, um, there was an effort on the part of the Department of Energy to establish an energy virtual one-stop shop so that all permits will be there. But despite that, uh, there is an executive order to that effect. Despite that, it still takes a long time, um, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, sir, for um, reiterating uh, a factor uh, also mentioned earlier uh, in our hearing. And I, I think it will uh, also aid us when we finally uh, assess and possibly update uh, the APIRA no, or our, our various laws uh, regulating the, the energy sector. My next question, Mr. Chair, um, so originally uh, addressed to, originally prepared to address it to NEDAP, but pwede ko rin po sanang itanong sa BOI. I believe we have uh, a resource person from BOI here with us today, uh, or, or also uh, Yusek Fita. Uh, tama po ba na kahit uh, nag-register na ang napakaraming renewable energy proponents sa Board of Investments nitong, uh, well, nung nakaraang 2023, ay maaring hindi pa rin matuloy ang investments na iyan. Uh, it's too bad that uh, Mr. Francisco is no longer here. Pero uh, tinanong ko po ito dahil binanggit nila kanina ni Mr. Francisco ng BDO Capital, presidente ng BDO Capital, na mahihirapan silang magpautang pala sa mga RE companies kung tulad ngayon, wala silang long-term power purchase agreements sa mga distribution utilities uh, gaya ng Meralco. So uh, how would BOI or USEC FITA advise that we approach and begin to solve this problem? and meet the banking sector halfway and give the support to our RE uh, proponents that they deserve and that we as electricity consumers are hoping for. Would the BOI like to take this question, uh, Mr. Chair? Very energy specific as in question, but uh, anyone who okay. wants wishes, please, uh, please feel free to answer the question, Senator Lisa. True, Mr. Chair, it's very energy specific. Mr. Chair. But, uh, just yeah. wondering if BOI might have a, an idea about it kasi may kinalaman sa kumaga, uh, yung mga RE investors ang star ngayon eh, ng mga bagong pumapasok na investments. Uh, pero if the banks won't be encouraged to uh, uh, provide them financing, paano ba to? How do we not miss this opportunity? Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Uh... Yeah. Oh, well, not addressing this one. Very okay. Lala ko yung klase namin yung walang, <laughs> walang may gustong sumagot. <laughs> so just to say, na, yung, yung, uh, just to add to the, uh, the problem of the permitting process, it's also related to the capacity of the ERC. Kasi isa sila sa bottleneck talaga, yung pag-approve ng mga proposals for this uh, power plant uh, projects. So it really has, uh, especially, you know, as uh, the economy grows, uh, badami nang dadami itong mga ganitong proposals. And so we really need to ano, beef up the capacity of ERC. Yan lang po, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Sorry with, uh, with your indulgence, uh, and Risa. Pero wala ba sa Philippine Development Plan yung streamlining of, ano, of procedures and processes? Is that there? In the, in yes, the... yes. I think it's, it's to do with the, uh, the number of uh, mga... I don't know, skilled personnel. <laughs> I may be... And uh, also, uh, sa PISAC sana, sa private, sa private Sector Advisory Council. Kasi, I know they meet directly with the President. Eh? And then, a lot of their recommendations have been already implemented or in the process of implementation, like NAIA, etc. So, eh, yung, yung mga yun, very urgent yung mga, ano yun, eh, very, kumbaga, makakatulong talaga sa pag-akit uh, ng mga investor. Eh, so, why don't we put it there sana, sa, aside from the development plan, pati sa PISAC agenda. Um, that's my suggestion. No? Thank you, Sandrisa. 
Salamat, Mr. Chair. I'm wondering if uh, BOI Governor Ramos Samaniego would like to just share some thoughts about my question. Sayang kasi mame, di ba? Dami nang pumapasok na RE uh, investors, RE companies. Sila nga yung majority ng mga bagong investments natin recently. Sa inyo po, sa board of investments. But uh, the banks have started to tell us uh, some of their difficulties. So how do we kumbaga, put the synapses in this sub uh, subset of the brain uh, together? Uh, thank you, Senator Risa. Essentially, it's a bilateral long-term supply contract, so it's a, it's it's more of a grid issue, uh, Senator uh, Risa. But uh, what the BOI is doing is, if they're registered with the BOI, what we do is we suspend their commercial operation, and uh, and as I I'm saying this, uh, Mr. Chair. We actually are, we have this executive order number 18 where we facilitate all of the uh, permits and licenses uh, for projects that are categorized as strategic industries. And uh, it's true, uh, last year, Mr. Chairman, we have like 937 billion worth of investment from RE. And as we're speaking right now, we are actually working out all of these uh, Dollars, ma'am. Dollar. Dollars po yun, Governor. 937. No, pesos. pesos. Um, but that was just like from June to February. So it's really, uh, we really have, when we opened the RE, uh, through the IRR actually, that was the time that there was this onslaught of, uh, of in all of these RE projects. And within that period, we have that much. Uh, investments in RE, which include as well uh, FDIs. But uh, on this, ma'am, uh, what we are doing is uh, through the EO18, we're looking at each and every permit and we're looking at all of these uh, um, areas of concern para i-address normally, ma'am, if... Uh, but this long-term power supply agreement is, is bilateral in nature. So what we could do is we can just encourage uh, the parties on how we can unbundle this issue, uh, Madam Senator. It's more of a grid issue. Uh, right now, we have also, in our recent meeting, uh, also with the EVOS, that's the one that uh, there's this energy um, online one-stop shop as well. We also met with NGCP, where we are now made aware that uh, the, all the queues on this, all of this uh, queuing would now be done by sometime April. So all of this, ma'am, uh, tinitignan na po namin isa-isa through the EO18, all of these issues and concerns on how or on how we can facilitate the operation actually, not just permitting, but as a, uh, uh, eventually the, the commercial operation of the projects, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Marami salamat din, um, Attorney Governor. Ramos uh, Samaniego. And, and of course, Mr. Chair, I also listened to what uh, you said, uh, Rosemary has repeatedly said na importante din yung papel ng ERC at yung pag-upgrade uh, uh, ng capacity niya. Also to facilitate uh, these essential connections like the long-term power purchase agreements. Mr. Chair, I think you said Rosemary is raising her hand to interject. Yes, you said Rose. Before you answer, you said Rose, I might forget eh. I wanted to ask this kanina ko pag gustong uh, hingin. Kasi nag-release nag ng uh, PR ang uh, PCOO kapon na uh, $12 billion dollars or pesos um, of the pledges have materialized. So could I get details on that, please? Uh, because that's a very impressive number. Uh, we'd like to know the details. Uh, what industries, what corporations, uh, et cetera, and so forth. So... If since we will take advantage of your presence to request that, please, uh, for, before the next hearing. Thank you. The next hearing is next week. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Senrisa. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. you, Chair. <laughs> but anyway, uh, no, just to say for the record as well, na uh, as per uh, press release, then ng, ano, ng ERC, they only have two hundred seventy-two plantilla positions. And they're supposed to do the you know processing of all these applications in addition to monitoring the performance. Then, so uh, we, we really need to uh, to to address the. Um, uh, I I I also know that they had uh, a large cut in their budget, yata. So yeah, so it has to be like I said, a system wide uh, uh, approach for this one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Mr. Chair, uh, the, the chair happens to be also the chair of our uh, co committee that uh, passes the budget. Uh, but I don't, I don't year. handle ERC. Yeah. It's Senator Gatsalian. Ah, that, that's true, Mr. Chair. Although, I, nung sinabi yun, nag-walk out yung staff ni Senator Gatsalian. Hindi, joke lang, joke lang. <laughs> baka pinatawa ko, baka pinatawa. In fact, I remember, Mr. Chair, that the committee, uh, as led by the the vice chair, uh, Sen. Sherwin, and this representation, we restored uh, the budget uh, of the ERC. So what you said, Karuspani, has been saying, uh, we'll, we'll find support, we'll continue to find support here uh, in the Senate for okay, the I think what uh, capacity uh, traditionally, ERC. Senator Gachalian, who's been handling the subcommittee of the Committee on Finance, handling the energy uh, agencies, he just juggles it. He doesn't, in fact, he adds to it. Uh, but but he, he sees, he, he realigns the budget where he sees fit. So he, if he sees, if he thinks, uh, he doesn't take it out of the DOE family is what I'm trying to say. No, Just in his defense. So. And I Go confirm ahead. that, Mr. Chair. Uh, so just a, a last question for for NEDA on, uh, on the uh, energy generation and uh, distribution. So, kasi nga napakaseryosong usapin po itong supply ng kuryente Kung wala to, of course, wala ang manufacturing sector na inaasahang magbibigay ng empleyo sa mga mawawala ng trabaho sa sektor ng agrikultura na patuloy na gumagamit na ng mga makina. Alam na ng mga bansang gaya ng Vietnam, which we've been talking about a lot, na ang susi para pumasok ang foreign investors sa manufacturing sector ay ang supply ng mura, sapat at maasahang kuryente. So, given these uh, so far uh, Yusek Rosemary, hindi kaya ang pag-amienda sa epiralo ang uh, dapat natin inaatupag sa halip na ang chacha? Any thought on that, ma'am? Yeah, Madam Chair, I have to uh, beg your indulgence and uh, we'll just get back to you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask my uh, colleague to uh, uh, give his comment on that. Thank you. Your colleague, ma'am, meaning uh, Director General Balisakan? Uh, yeah, and Yusek Dokoy. <laughs> Yusek Kapuno. Uh, Senrisa, what was the question? We, we missed uh, the question. Oh. I was just wrapping up that napaka-importante yung mga usaping kuryente. So, hindi kaya amyandahan na lang natin yung epira sa halip na amyandahan ng konstitusyon. Maybe the Philippine Development Plan even had some points about that. Comments there from the resource persons? She said that uh, the good USEC said she would uh, ask Director General Balisaka. Anything on the uh, development plan regarding IPIRA? Or you take that as a, also as an uh, initial condition? Yeah, yeah please uh, speak in the mic, Yusek Rose. It's please. in the legislative agenda. Meron ho doon? Uh, yes, to, yes. to amend IPIRA? Yes. Ah, okay. So we'll just ask for details maybe, uh, Senorisa. Thank you, Chair. It's good to know that it's on the LEDAC priority legislative agenda, uh, at least probably two years before this whole idea of amending the Constitution came up. Uh, Chair, I think Yusek Fita is also raising her hand. Uh, yes, yes, check. of course, Yusek Fita. And anyone, for that matter, after her could, could uh, no. offer a response. Go ahead, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Risa. Um, actually, I uh, w was raising my hand to go back to the PPA question that was uh, raised by Senator Risa a while ago. But I believe as well that we need to review um, the EPIRA. Um, There's so many things, so many developments that have transpired since the time it was passed. And uh, hence, um, there have been uh, certain issues uh, that would merit uh, um, amendments to uh, the EPIRA. But... Um, Senator Risa, uh, Mr. Chair, on the PPAs, uh, of course, these are crucial for us to secure the financial viability of energy projects as they guarantee a market for the electricity generated and providing a steady revenue stream for uh, investors. However, there have been a lot of uh, challenges, as uh, earlier pointed out, and um, there are certain um, measures that uh, we need to uh, focus our efforts on, particularly in terms of strengthening our policy and regulatory frameworks. We need more uh, clear regulatory uh, guidelines and uh, incentives for RE would um, also be, uh, we need to continue uh, because there are already um, incentives in place, tax breaks, feed-in tariffs, subsidies, and uh, 
uh, I, we, we uh, hope to be able to sustain um, these uh, incentives for RE and enhancing the financial models uh, in order for us to address uh, the risks. Some uh, risk mitigation uh, instruments would uh, need to be uh, developed along with uh, some certain flexible pricing structures that uh, could be put in place or for now probably they need to be studied um, in order for us to uh, see how uh, this could be uh, implemented given uh, our uh, current ten context and um, promoting more public-private uh, partnerships, fostering collaboration between the public and private sectors to share risks and uh, benefits, capacity building, enhancing the capacity of our LGUs um, and utilities to negotiate and manage uh, PPAs, ensuring they are structured to attract uh, investors while serving public interests, and um, improving market access and infrastructure by way of um, developing or establishing grid infrastructure investments uh, that would ensure that the generated power can be effectively distributed and sold um, and hence enhancing uh, the attractiveness of PPAs and then also uh, open access policies and encouraging innovation and technology adoption. For instance, uh, th the support for emerging technologies and digital platforms for PPA uh, transactions. And we have some startups, by the way, who are uh, already uh, creating this uh, digital platforms for uh, electricity, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Yusek Fita. Uh, very much appreciated the uh, several concrete input that will guide uh, not only uh, that will guide us not only in this hearing but also dun sa gagawin namin hopefully proseso ng uh, pagtingin pagbabalik tingin uh, sa epira uh, moving forward. So uh, right now, Mr. Chair, claro, there are maybe a million things we can do. Uh, now, halimbawa, ayusin yung permitting process, uh, identifying deterrents for industries that are already liberalized uh, nang hindi kailangan ang, ang cha-cha. Do I still have time in this round for another topic, Mr. Chair? Uh, you've used up to... 11 minutes, so uh, I, I, uh, I'll, ask, uh, I'll ask Senator Bato if he wishes to ask uh, questions. Yeah, I'll, 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 uh, Mr. Chair, I think usually Senator Bato is very sure. fast, so we can go okay, back to you Okay, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chair. Uh, Senator Bato, yeah, with your permission, Senator Isa. I just only have one question, Mr. Chair. Thank you, thank you. Then one question lang. Uh, sorry for, I am late. Uh, hindi ko narinig lahat ng mga session ng mga ahinsya nandito. I just want, I just would like to uh, get the recapitulation of their positions. Can I request, Mr. Chair, or uh, we have still have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Resource persons around. Uh, can I see a raising of hands? Uh, who among you, based on your uh, agency's uh, position, who among you are in favor of uh, amending the restrictive uh, provisions of our economic provisions of our constitution? Can I see a raising of hands? One, two, three, four, five, six. No one on the so, private side, just six. the government side. Government side, six. Are, are you asking also the, just to clarify, Sen Bato, kasama ba yung, are they also, they're also part of the, the survey. Yeah, you're part of the survey, so you have you have the option to abstain if you wish. Yeah, yeah, gusto ko lang malaman. Okay, yes, yes. can we ask for the raising of hands again, sir? Yeah, please. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So, eight. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I have stayed. I think for a foreigner, this would be a very difficult thing to do. Thank you. I understand. I understand. You've made your position clear, Mr. Payne. Thank you. Thank you. So, eight, uh, two. Ayo lang, Mr. Chair. Maraming salamat. Thank you. Ang galing nung tanong mo, Senator Bato. Mr. Chair. Dahil lalayt ako dumating. Apat na oras kami nakaraupo dito. Ikaw, in a few minutes, na tanong mo ka agad. That's the purpose of our hearing, di ba? Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair. Galing, ang galing. Back to Senator Riz. Mr. Chair. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Senator Riz, I've been informed by my staff, si Dr. Doy Santos has been raising his hand for quite some time. With your permission, we'll just uh, ask him if he wants to contribute. Might be on the subject matter at hand. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Santos. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, Senators. Um, so in response, We can't hear you, sir. Could you speak a little louder? Sorry. 
Uh, how's that, Mr. Chair? Can you hear I understand me now? you've been raising your hand. You wanted to contribute to this. Yes, I have. Yes, sir. Yep. Yes, Go ahead, sir. sir. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Bet much better now. Much better. Okay. So in response to the Honorable uh, Madam Senator's question, um, the emerging I would like to share the emerging practices now um, so the, uh, from my state where I'm based now in South Australia, where the power prices used to be the most expensive in the nation, it has now gone to the cheapest. And a lot of that has gotten to do with the fact that we made a transition into renewables earlier. And um, at one point, there was even a major blackout because the grid connection to Victoria was cut during a power out during a storm. And then Elon Musk came in and he, there was a there was um, an agreement to build batteries. So 100 uh, megawatts. That's what he did in, in 90 days. Um, and so one of the things that came out of that was that battery storage is not only power generation but it helped to stabilize the grid by providing ancillary services. And in fact, helped lower the cost because when, when you have variable generation and it, and, and it varies during the day, the, the task of the grid is to maintain parity between supply and demand. So the battery storage was thought to help in providing prevent blackouts by supplying energy. The, the utility derived from that um, 100 million um, investment was that it helped to stabilize the grid because you're talking here about microseconds rather than minutes to, to balance the, the inflow, influx. And it has resulted in that lower power. And then the other thing is that um, microgrids. So earlier it was highlighted that a lot of the investments are off the grid. So in fact, as I mentioned earlier in my um, statement, that most of these projects are remote from the grid, but are actually closer to the consumer. So it can provide to households in the locality, um, but then if you're going to set up a microgrid, then you're no longer engaged in power generation. You are now engaged in power distribution. So these are the emerging, and then there are these platforms, as was mentioned earlier by uh, the USEC. And then lastly, there's the ASEAN grid, where they're actually Australia, in my home state, they're producing solar commercials at a commercial scale to feed into Singapore under through undersea cables via Indonesia. And so there is a plan by the ASEAN group of countries to connect ASEAN. So in fact, if you're talking about foreign power, that means that the power, when there's a deficit in the Philippines and there's cheaper power elsewhere, it could help meet our demand. But then you're talking that the power generators are completely foreign, right? But then, of course, there needs to be a connection. There needs to be a grid connection. And all this renewable, we are aiming for 50% renewable by 2035. If we have to wait for all those permitting and things like that, the 200 signatures or so that are needed, are we going to meet that target? Are we going to do it in a stable manner? Because flexibility is needed, but also stability. And so I submit, Mr. Chair, that the technical know-how, the capabilities, the innovation, for that to be diffused, it's all being, it's all happening in the major centers of powerhouses of the world for that to diffuse to the Philippines, we need to be more open. And so if we were to just simply amend the PSA Act and include grid distribution and transfer, how thin are we going to slice that provision? Because sooner or later, EVs will come into the picture. So then are you going to include public utility vehicles? How thin are you going to keep slicing that ham until there's no longer any ham left? So it might be better, Mr. Chair, that we consider um, the proposal at hand that you have laid before the table through the RBH sticks. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, very useful information. And uh, in a way, it makes us sad because uh, Australia is going to connect to Singapore, but uh, Tayo, 
yung connection lang sa grid, di natin magawagawa. <laughs> connection of Visayas and Mindanao to the grid, di natin magawagawa for so many years already. That's, that's really sad, actually. I wish uh, uh, the government could really uh, push on that connection because that's that's uh, leaving a lot of power, uh, what's the word, stranded or uh, not available to those who need it. Yeah. St. Teresa? Yeah. But, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I also appreciate the, the inputs of uh, Dr. Ocampo. Uh, and uh, not just sad, but uh, provocative, like this ASEAN grid. Mali ba natin kaya natin humabol dyan? And again, not solely through the, the cha-cha route. For example, if uh, I'm just thinking aloud here, if we were to amend existing laws, including the EPIRA, and acting together, they could create uh, those connections that that are needed. So, just um, just something to think about as we move forward uh, conducting these hearings. Of course, also in aid of of legislation. So, marami salamat uh, para dyan, sir. Um, uh, sige on the on the public service act, naman. If you sec uh, Rosemary will bear with me, I'd like to uh, pose these questions to Neda as well. So under the Public Service Act, uh, NEDA can recommend the classification of a public service as a critical infrastructure. So ano-ano po yung mga public services na ngayon kinoconsider na critical infrastructures? Yeah, Madam Chair. Uh, right now, we're just uh, looking at... Uh... Uh, yeah, it's, it's the telecoms industry that is still uh, in the identified in the law and in the IRR. Uh, we are actually um, uh, we are actually requesting for a, a TA on this uh, because uh, we are supposed to come up also with a with a baseline survey, and uh, and so we are uh, we are requesting for a TA from from World Bank on which to base actually yung uh, pag uh, pag pag uh, define ng ano yung gagawin ng ano public utilities thank you so sa ngayon prior the baseline survey meron na ba kayong inirerekomenda i mean ang neda na iba pang public services for classification as critical infrastructures ah uh, none yet madam chair ah uh, mr chair thank you all right ah uh, salamat ma'am um I'm asking this also because kasama po ni dating senator at ngayon secretary uh, Ralph Recto at ni dating senador Kiko Pangilinan uh, actually kumontra po ako sa Public Service Act amendments dahil sa tingin ko yung telecommunications, airports at mga tren at riles dapat manatiling public utilities na hindi mapapa sa ilalim sa kontrol ng dayuhan. Pero sa huli, so ipinasa ang RA 11659 para palawakin ang public services na pwedeng pasukin ng dayuhan. Pero pagkatapos ng maraming debate, nilinaw ng batas yung kakaibang, pag, kakaibang pagtrato sa critical infrastructure. Na sa tingin ko po, nararapat lang. So dito, bawal magmay-ari ang anumang entity na kontrolado o kumikilos para sa dayuhang gobyerno o foreign state-owned enterprise. And I uh, I remember that uh, our good chair uh, himself, uh, Sonny, even interpolated uh, the sponsor on this specific point. And if I remember correctly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, his concern then was on the law effectively allowing China to own and take control of Dito Telecom. But according to our good uh, chair of, of that bill, now law, may additional safeguards sa telecoms industry dahil tinuturing nga itong critical infrastructure. So that. Ngayon, ang legislatura, so parehong sa Senado at saka sa House of Representatives, kinilala yung pangangailangang protektahan ang critical infrastructure. So sa RBH6, um, sa tingin ng NEDA, tama po ba na wala nang ganitong distinction, wala nang ganitong proteksyon sa critical infrastructure? Uh, actually, no. Uh, we, we uh, it, you know, national security is really an issue that we should be, uh, we should really take very seriously. And so, kaya nandun pa rin talaga yung, ano, yung, yung mga, kumbaga yung protection na yun, uh, really looking at uh, the security review. Uh, so that's part of it. Meron na actually guidelines para doon. 
uh, and uh, yeah, all those other uh, all those other safeguards with respect to information, koko sila ng yung parang ISO na certification and all that. Thank you, Madam Mr. Chair. At ngayong lumalalim yung hidwaan sa pagitan ng mga bansa, mas nagiging konkreto yung mga banta sa cybersecurity natin. Di ba, mas mahalaga pa nga na protektahan yung national security natin? Y yes, of course. But uh, like I said, actually yung yung issue of cybersecurity, uh, nandiyan talaga siya no? regardless of, uh, uh, of course, like you said with, with the geopolitical tension mas uh, mas siguro mas uh, mas prominent siya uh, but just the same um we really need to uh we really need to beef up our capacity to uh, to guard against cyber attacks uh, salamat you said so i think one thing uh, that's affirmed to me dito sa recent exchange natin kailangan uh, explicit even for those who who support RBH6 na merong pa ring pagkakaiba yung uh, yung mga ituturing na critical infrastructure uh, hindi sila kapareho lang ng iba na pwede lang buksan sa 100% foreign ownership dahil nga critical infrastructure sila so isang halimbawa lang before i i leave this topic uh, napabalita na mayroon ng tatlong prospective winning bidders yung 170.6 billion peso uh, na iya privatization sa pagkakaalam ko bo all of the three bidders have foreign partners based on existing cap on foreign equity ownership pero sa amended public service act natin ay uh, iniwan sa discretion ng pangulo ng Pilipinas kung alin sa natitira pang public services ang itatalaga nito na critical infrastructure. So, sa RBH6 po ba, uh, nakikita nyo ba na may plano na nating ito dobukas sa foreign ownership ang lahat at alisin na ang naiwang discretion sa Pangulo sa bagay na ito? I think the issue of uh, of uh, security, national security, for that matter, uh, is you know it's it's really uh, parang overarching consideration naman to. Parang uh, regardless of whether we uh, we 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 go by the uh, RBH six or, or or not, nandyan, nandyan lagi yung ano consideration for national security. So again, dapat explicit na mayroong pa ring discretion ang presidente to determine which are critical uh, infrastructures and therefore not subject to total uh, opening to foreign ownership. I think Madam Chair if uh, if the language of the law is yung ilalagay lang yung unless otherwise provided uh, for by law and our current uh, uh, our current legal framework is uh, the amended uh, foreign investment act and then the amendment uh, public service act nakalagay naman yun doon thank you thank you ma'am um, binabalikan ko lang po itong issue uh, mr chair kasi maalala natin nung nagkaroon ng shutdown sa airport nung nakaraang new year sa ka labor day sinabi ko na hindi silver bullet yung solution na privatization dahil Ang nakita kong mas problema dito ay kapabayaan, uh, hindi lack of funds or opportunities para sa modernization. Na IA actually generates an annual operating income of at least 15 billion pesos. This was pre-pandemic, of course, 2019. At nakakabawi rin ito uh, ngayon. Unfortunately, very little is left with MIAA for operations as 50% or more of its net income is remitted to the National Treasury on top of the 20% national government share in the authorities' operating income based on actual collections. Kaya hirap ang MIAA sa sariling upgrading at modernization. And according to the Workers' Union, Mr. Chair, the Samahan ng Mga Manggagawa sa Palipara ng Pilipinas or SMPP, 5-7% to na lang ang budget para sa maintenance every year. Hindi parang kahawig halos ito ng Transco na kumikita naman ng 20 billion pesos kada taon pero ipinamigay natin sa lokal at dayuhang consortium ng NGCP para patakbuhin at pagkitaan. So sana we uh, 
does Neda have any thought about that? What what we did to Transco in this whole privatization process? No, no, no. Just to say that uh, in the amended uh, foreign investment, uh, uh, sorry, Public Service Act, uh, there actually is a provision for the performance requirement uh, monitoring uh, by the by the regulator. So, there mga ano, mga performance uh, parameters and uh parang on this basis uh merong ano yan eh may i believe my sanction na uh, no, 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 i just forgot kung uh ano yung nilagay doon na no, na sanction pero kasama yun sa safeguard uh, with respect to transco i uh, i'm not privy to to that info unless si uh, Yusek Agabi would Yusek Agabi care to comment on this Mr. Chair uh um, I'm sorry we didn't catch the question Chair. the I was uh, wondering about uh, how Transco was handled. You know, speaking of performance requirements, kung in terms of its financial uh, performance, it was it was profiting twenty billion pesos every year. But uh, we turned it over to the NGCP consortium. And in terms of performance requirements, I don't know how well um, uh, the uh, NGCP is acting as a as a system operator. Um. Uh... So um, I think there are some uh, sectors or there's some people who believe, um, based on hindsight, that maybe um, the national grid should not have been privatized. Um, but then there's also um, views which says that privatization actually worked because um, they were able to put in um, the, ne the needed capital to improve the grid itself. So there's a, there's, it's mixed, uh, Madam Chair. Fair enough, Mr. Chair. Uh, mixed Your permission, record. Senator. Yes, Mr. Chair. We're still paying the debts from Napocor. Uh, Bayad na ba yun? Yung from uh, the time of Nap uh, when Napocor, when the the whole uh, power sector was uh, in public hands. If you look we incurred at massive debts, di ba? Yes, sir. If and you look, uh, when, when, have we paid those debts? Or we are still paying for oh, some. We're still paying those debts, correct. If you look at your bill, you will see the universal charges. Um, UCSD is universal charge stranded debt. And SCC stranded contract costs. Those are the amounts we're still paying for, uh, Mr. Chair. A reminder, because we often hear not not from centuries, but from other sectors that dapat gobyerno nagahandle niyan eh. Eh, dating ang gobyerno nagahandle tignan niyo ng yare, di ba? Go ahead, Sen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, fair enough, Yusek, it is a mixed record of privatization, pero I'm glad na may openness of mind tayo na sometimes privatization is not the best mode. Uh, sector by sector or industry by industry sa ating uh, ekonomiya. Kaya uh, exciting din tignan kung paano mangyayari yung review at saka amendment or updating ng, ng IPIRA. Yung huling tanong ko, Mr. Chair, tamang-tama, uh, Yusek Agabin is on board. It's for the DOF. Uh, ito naman, itatanong ko sana kay uh, Sec. Ralph, uh, pero just in case you've had a conversation on this subject uh, with him, uh, mula nung deliberation sa Public Service Act, yung concerns nyo ba, concerns ni Sec. Ralph ha, on the protection of critical infrastructure, nagbago ba ito? Kasi, maalala ko rin, uh, my colleagues will correct me if I'm wrong, nung deliberation sa PSA bill, uh, may sinasabi si Sec. Ralph noon, Sen noon, masyadong loose yung definition ng public utilities to the point na kontra sa at least sense at spirit ng deliberations ng CONCOM of 1986. Naalala ko, uh, na, napansin ni Sec. Ralph noon, Sen. Ralph, na yung C, uh, sa bill, yung seaport, critical infra, pero airport, hindi. Uh, so, uh, would, uh, would the good USEC have knowledge kung mula no nagbago yung concerns ni, uh, ni Sec. Ralph dun sa usaping yan? Uh, interestingly, um, Mr. Chair, Madam Senator, when we, did, we were discussing it, um, Sec. Ralph did mention that he, he voted against it. Those were his same concerns and he actually said that, you know, I'm actually open to it when it comes to toll roads. So, um, and he didn't say that his view has changed. He did mention his uh, perspective when um, you were crafting the uh, amendment to the PSA, Madam Chair. Maraming salamat. It's, I think, for us legislators, as interesting to, to look at or be reminded of the deliberations on bills as it is for us all now to 
uh, be reminded of the deliberations on the Constitution. So marami salamat, uh, Yusek Agabit. Marami salamat, Mr. Uh, Chair. Those are my questions thank for today. Thank you very today. much, uh, Senator Risa. Senator Bato, anything else before we... Uh, thank you. Uh, any last word from the resource persons? I, I'm sure we're all somewhat uh, exhausted from, uh, but from a very stimulating discussion. And uh, allow me to thank our resource persons, especially those who stayed, uh, and our colleagues especially, and Risa Senbato, and those who came earlier. Any any last words uh, before we suspend the hearing? Uh, of course, we'll continue. Mr. The Chair. subcommittee will continue to have hearings uh, Mr. next Chair. week. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. Yes, who is? Uh, Dr. Santos here. Ah, Dr. Santos, yes. Online. Dr. Santos, go ahead. Yes, my 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 last statement actually is um in relation also to the question of the honorable Madam Senator Risa earlier about corruption. If we go back in time to our history, oh, no, it was actually when we when we tried to to be more preferential to domestic uh, uh ownership in the 60s that that growth slowed and 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 corruption thrived, and in fact, that's what created the first boom bust cycle, and um, and um, and similarly in the seventies when we tried state ownership, state intervention, as I pointed out in my statement earlier, it became unsustainable, and then FDI fell. So, I know that some have have spoken about well, uh, Dr. Carl, uh, Carlos said. Um, Where's the where's the empirical data? We we don't just need to rely on charts and those statistics, but also our history, and um, collectively our memories are very short. Very few really go back to 1902 when our history books don't actually talk about how, where these economic restrictions arose. Why are we the only country out of the 18 that you your 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 honor surveyed? Your, your your people surveyed. Why are we the only country with these? And it was, as I pointed out, a strange quirk in our history, in our in the origins of our country, which eventually you heard of path dependent. Sorry, Professor Fabella, my professor, will scold me for not mentioning this. We ended up following that ever since, and in fact, expanding it. So my last statement is: if we want to truly enter a new phase, a new era, a new or bagong Pilipinas. The best way to signal it is to start to unwind the centuries-old pattern of being close to the world and restricting. Um, thank you, Your Honors. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Thank you Santos. Uh, Senator Risa, then back to Mr. Peña. Thank you so much, Dr. Santos. And I apologize, Mr. Chair. I, I was addressing you earlier and I because I saw the nameplate of Attorney Ocampo across me. I actually called you Dr. Ocampo earlier. I apologize for that. And thank you so much for your inputs. Thanks for being called Dr. Salamat. Attorney Ocampo. No. Uh, uh, Mr. Peña. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I guess the only thing I would say is the world is changing very, very rapidly. The competition is increasing. And if we want to keep up with it, we're going to have to, whatever we do, whether it's the bureaucracy, whether it's the legislature, whether it's the constitution, we're going to have to move nimbly and quick. Well said. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, from uh, uh, our place, this has been a very uh, useful uh, exercise. and. Uh, um, hopefully, you've convinced some of our colleagues, but uh, uh, we'll continue nonetheless. Thank you very much, uh, Your Honors, and uh, we appreciate your presence here this morning. We'll suspend the hearings.